Okay, so uh, we're we're still we're still reading Daggerheart, and the GM's still reading it, and nobody's prepped anything, and Matt Mercer's haunting my dreams, and Spencer Stark's haunting my nightmares. Uh, so session's canceled. I have a headache. Hello, we're back. That made it sound really miserable. I'm not actually miserable right now. <laughs> I will say at least all the characters are done. Look like what? ten minutes. The characters. All the characters. Yeah, all the characters are done for the game. Oh. I, I was trying to add on to. Your I, I see you were bit. trying okay, to add on to the bit, okay. but I right, missed it, mind. and now we're just fine. awkwardly. Okay. Yep. Okay. okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, One Isaiah's bonus here. point for Daggerheart. Eight fucking day character creation. Very <laughs> fast. Thumbs up. Matt is also here. Mm, am I though? Am I really? <laughs> I don't know. Are you? <laughs> mm. Oh, Christ right, almighty. I am Josh. I am here and I do not know why. But I am. Uh, this was a really awkward start. Anyway, round two of Dagger Heart. But up, up, but up, but. Um, you may have noticed we stopped about uh, halfway through ish last time. Uh, the previous episode was all about the player rules, so this time we have to talk about the GM side of things, which I think is going to be... Somehow I'm going to have more to say about the GM side, which I know is maybe a little bit of a concerning statement for some people. Yeah. Me and Matt. Matt and maybe Brett. (laughs) Potentially. Oh, Brett, how are your thoughts on the last episode? Insert here. You know, I no. <laughs> He's not allowed to have thoughts. He can, he can have his thoughts to himself in his cage. Can't wait till he just like auto tunes the shit out of your voice throughout the whole episode. <laughs> it just beats me. Uh, Puts on the the goblin filter or, or the little green man filter from fucking uh, voice mod. Yeah. I don't know what you're talking about, but all right. Um, it just makes you sound like a like a like. It makes you sound like a little green man alien. Like, the uh, like it's to, so funny. I need okay. to rebuy voice awesome. mod. Thank you. It was so fun. Anyway. You didn't uh, get a perpetual license? No, I bought it and it was in my old computer and then my old computer exploded. So, yes, he got a perpetual. You can probably license transfer. I mm. Probably not. They often, if that's the case, they don't let you. Ah, oof. I'll figure it out. That's neither here nor there, though. Matt was talking about paying for voice mod. But you know what you can do right now for free? Hit the follow or subscribe button on whatever platform you're currently listening on. That's right crazy. Now, totally free. No licensing required. Just hit the button. I mean, you don't have to have a phone, I get, or a computer. But, you know, other than that, free. Hit the button. And the internet... And electricity. Anyway, don't worry. We're not going to go down that rabbit hole. Uh, oh, fuck, I don't. I can't pay for this. I'm out of here. <laughs> I mean, you can send us money if you want, I guess. We could give you some a PayPal link or something. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Sign up to the Sessions Cancel OnlyFans to get, you know, feet pics and yeah. D&D opinions. Yeah, exactly. I'll be the former. Nothing weird about that. <clears throat> Nothing at all. Anyway. GM section. Gentlemen, any 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 immediate strong thoughts before we get into it? Anything you need to get off your chest now? No. No, nothing protect like you wrote it in your notes. Uh, uh-huh. A lot of the opening section, I feel like. I don't want to go as far as to say a lot of it's common sense because, you mm. know, we all have years of GMing experience behind us, but it almost feels like a lot of the beginning stuff is really common sense. And I guess it sh- it's supposed to be right. It's, well, it's supposed to be for new new GMs who haven't run before. It's kind of an introductory to the idea of GMing. Yeah, well, it's not yeah. really an opinion, but it is something that I kind of was like, <clears throat> yeah, these about. are things that you learn as a dungeon master through playing or like I know a lot of these that you know we're about to go over. I learned from like watching videos or reading it on from various you can, other. Yeah, you, know, you can definitely learn them stuff. from a lot of places. I, I, <laughs> I think what you're noticing, Isaiah, is, is just really what I was kind of pointing out last time is that they expect this to be everybody's second game. Right. Yeah. yeah. You've played yeah. D&D. Here's a different thing. But, you know, maybe you don't 
fully have a grasp of how, how tabletop works. So here's like some guidance from us because you've only played D&D type shit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I did have something I wanted to talk about with the D20 versus 2D12 thing, but I'm sure we'll get to that at some point. Was it in yeah in reference to something specific? Uh, for comp for for GM facing combat. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we'll get around yeah. to that. Yeah, same. Honestly. <laughs> okay. You guys might be thinking a similar thing to what I was thinking to be. Um. Yeah. So the GM section talks about running an adventure. It starts with which I kind of a weird one to start with. I don't know. Maybe that was just me. I felt I saw running an adventure first and I was like, that's odd. I felt like core guidance should have been first. Mm -hmm. Um, like Isaiah just said, there's a, for GMs new to dagger heart section, but a lot of it is you could take out the dagger heart part and just read it as for new GMs. That's kind of what that section reads. Like there's a couple of things in there that are definitely, um, dagger heart specific stuff in the sense of like where it talks about every role carries weight uh that's a very similar thing in again dungeon world and apocalypse world and and blades and stuff like that where you're not just where in D, you might just make a check to like kick a door or whatever and then if you fail nothing happens right in a game like dagger heart in a game like apocalypse world in a game like blades the idea is every role if you succeed, something happens. If you fail, something happens. There should never, there should basically never be like a null result. Nothing interesting happens. That's, that's basically what that little bit's talking about where it says every role carries weight. Um, and, and the part where it says the story always moves forward, same kind of deal. Um, and then it talks about narrative first, which again, very dungeon worldy, very bladesy. Um, but yeah, it's a very like new GM section. Nothing really interesting there. The core guidance section where it talks about player principles. I, these are just the principles from Dungeon World. Just they're just the Dungeon World principles. Just straight up. Almost identical. I believe Hold On Gently is not in there. Um, and like the second one that says. Uh, f- so it says, so be a flan. I'll just read them out. Be a fan of the yeah. players and PCs. That's ripped directly from Apocalypse World and Dungeon World whole cloth. Mm. Fill the world with life, wonder, and danger. I believe uh, Dungeon World says make the world a fantastical place or something along those lines. Basically the mm. same sentiment. Um, yeah. Ask and incorp- ask questions, incorporate the answers. I think Dungeon World says like ask and play to find out or something like that. Uh, mm. Hold on gently, I don't think is in there. Uh, And then play to find out what happens is, again, straight from Apocalypse World and Dungeon World, like just whole cloth. Uh, So, yeah, they're just they're just the same. I thought that was quite funny. Um, It's not like obviously they're phrases, so I'm not going to say this is like plagiarism or anything. You can't can't like copyright a phrase. Um, But, yeah, they're uh, they're from Dungeon World. They're from Apocalypse World, and they pretty much have the same sentiment. So they're not bad. Um, no, I mean, I actually really love just the idea funny. of the first one. Be a fan of the players that like that's something that should be in all kind of like GM guidebooks or something like that. Like it's hey, funny you want to be a fan of your players. It's funny you say that, Matt, because ever yeah. since Apocalypse World came out back in the Dizay, be a fan of your players, I think, is something that people have been adding into their games quite a lot. And I think it's because of Apocalypse World. <laughs> So most likely, yeah. I mean, it's something you hear from pretty much every uh, uh, talking head on the DM on like the D&D or RPG side of things. And it's true, right? It's it's one of those things where it's like everyone's saying it because it's absolutely true. Basically, yeah, like they, the days of adversarial DMs. I think they're not gone completely, but they, it's almost pretty it's close, <laughs> pretty, pretty close, close to dead. Yeah. And, and, and for good reason, like you don't want to be playing at a game with a dickhead DM. Much the same. You don't want to be a DM playing in a game with a bunch of dickhead players. There's got to be some like commonality between the two. And like, yeah, as a DM, you want to be a fan fan of the players. You don't want to like constantly just throwing shit at them to hurt them and beat them their characters down. You want to throw challenging shit at them, but you want the players to win in the end. It's the point of the fucking game. 
if a TPK happens by accident, you know, shit happens, but you want the players to kill the monsters. That's the point. Uh, uh, yes. Unless you're Josh, I guess. I don't know. No, 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 no. I, no, I was going to agree. I was just going to say I pulled <laughs> up the... No, no, I mean, you're right. Yes. The days of adversarial jamming, I think, are pretty much gone unless your players specifically say, you know, that's like the kind of game we want to do. Like maybe we're doing like tournament rules or something like that on purpose. You know, yeah. Sure. But for the most part, yeah. Uh, so uh, Dungeon World, the agenda, it says portray a fast, fantastical world fill the characters lives with adventure play to find out what happens so yeah um the fan of the players one i i thought it was in dungeon world but it might be in apocalypse world and not in dungeon world for some reason but whatever either way um and then we have uh but anyway from there and then it says so dungeon world or er, it says gm best practices in dagger heart and i think this is again really symbol similar to the principles list in Dungeon World. So let's see. Cultivate a curious player, earn your player's trust, treat characters as competent, cut to the action, help the players use the game, create a meta conversation, ground the world in motive, bring the game's mechanics to life, reframe rather than reject, work in moments and montages. Uh, that's the Dagger Heart list. To give you an idea of the Dungeon World list, draw maps, leave blanks, address the characters, not the players, embrace the fantastic, make a move that follows, never speak the main name of your move, give every monster life, name every person, ask questions, use the answers, be a fan of the characters, think dangerous, oh there it is, be a fan of the characters, think dangerous, begin and end with the fiction, think off screen too. Obviously it's not an identical list, but you can, you can hear that the vibe is very similar uh so the uh the influences on this particular section of the game are very clear which again fine i just it's kind of funny reading through um i don't i guess i don't know do you guys have any beef or commentary or anything like that on these particular lists i assume not but you know no, no, not really to say. I, I, I agree with pretty much all of them. Like, um, uh, I'm trying to think if there's, is there one that I don't feel like is that necessary? Again, not to piggyback off what you said earlier, but like I said, the, the whole, like, it's not common sense, but it's common things that GM should learn about or after a while know of and do in, in their games. Oh, uh, so yeah, so that, but something that I, I really liked was, uh, ground the world in motive. Uh, it's, it's, so it's the opposite of a complaint. This is something that I think a lot of people mean to say when they're talking about like, um, be realistic in, in a role-playing game, like have there be a reason for things to happen. Right. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think that's just the best way to, to, to word it. I, like yeah. have it grounded in motive. Don't let shit happen for no reason, and don't let shit fly in the face of like basic logic and reason. Yeah, I didn't even notice. I didn't even really pay attention to that one, but yeah, makes sense. I it, it just it stuck out to me because it's something that I, um, you know, when, in the first campaign that I played in, that there that was a, a big issue. An issue, like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, because it's like, oh, we just saved this person's family. Oh, but they found out you're from this place, so they're really racist. And it's like, really? <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> yep. The the DM throws an intellect devourer at the at the cleric, but then jumps twenty feet towards the barbarian with a minus two intelligence and uh, possesses him. Yeah, that's PTS. <laughs> Fuck that guy! I hate him. <laughs> <Where's he at? laughs> Um, I don't even remember his name. Fuck him. I don't remember his name, but fuck him. Um, yeah, and if anyone heard that list and is like, what the hell do any of those mean? They're, they're, the entire section of the book breaks down each individual statement into what they mean about those, so you can get a deeper dive in on that. I'm not going to go into it now. Honestly, though, a lot of them probably mean what you think, you mean, what you think they mean when you read them. Like, they're intentionally... Oh. 
the meta intuitive. conversation one was a little i uh i'm not saying it shouldn't be there. oh create a meta but, conversation yeah, yeah call it something else because to me I, I don't know what i was expecting when i read meta conversation but not like that. talking about safety tools not yeah, it. yeah 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 so like true. keep that section just name it something else because that confused the shit out of me <laughs> yeah um one thing I did like, yeah, so Daggerheart actually also immediately after that section has pitfalls to avoid, which is something that Apocalypse World and Dungeon World do not have. Uh, I like those. Uh, so avoid oh, yes. un- undermining the heroes, always telling the players what to lo- what to roll, letting seeds drag on too long, singular solutions, over planning and letting fear go unused. That last Can bullet point. Can you imagine not telling your players what to roll? Hey, roll me a check. What, well, what kind of check? I'm not telling you. That's not what it means. Right. <laughs> no, I know. I know. It doesn't. It just, roll, really just, roll me a, just roll me a d20 real quick. For what? What they're, uh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. What they're saying with always telling your players what to roll, what they mean is like, in you know, when you're playing D&D and you say, okay, player, roll an athletics check. The type of role you're supposed to make is supposed to be a little bit of a conversation in Daggerheart. So the, the GM might say, okay, you want to climb the wall, use your strength. And the player might say, can I use my agility because I'm a rogue and X, Y, and Z reason and I use this method of climbing? Could I potentially roll agility? Mm. The GM... Can I parkour yeah. up the mountain? Yeah, yeah. And then the GM <laughs> says, all right, yeah, that's reasonable. That's what they mean by don't mm. always tell the player, you know, have a little bit of a conversation about what could potentially be rolled. Um, yeah. but yes the idea of just roll things just don't worry about it. just roll things <laughs> um core mecha- so and then we get on to the GM's core mechanics uh so the GM uses is, is this is what you were talking about Isaiah uh yeah so the players always use 2d12 the GM uses a d20 to resolve all their things um and like I don't remember if I said this in the previous episode or not. I probably did. I, I I just I just feel like the GM shouldn't roll any dice, period. Other than maybe damage dice. And even that one you could potentially take out. Like See, I'm just confused on why they don't also just roll two D twelve. I yeah, don't I, like, I make life easier. I, I, I don't know. I yeah, I'm confused. if I were to gander a guess, I think it is because uh 2d12 has a more reliable distribution curve in terms of the numbers you will get. They will be more middle of the road more often, whereas a d20 is inherently more swingy. Yeah, it so, says here, yeah, the swingy yeah, unpredictable nature yeah. of a d20's result helps facilitate both these experiences in the session. Yeah, okay. So I yeah, think, I, I, I guess, I guess the, the idea is to make it so that the situation for the bad guys is a little more unpredictable than it is for the heroes, which... Is, is that fine? I guess. I don't know. But now is that putting too much? I'm trying to think, like, is that giving the players advantage? Or are you as a DM trying not nerfing, but like trying to make your roles more swingy because you don't want to. And I mean, there have been multiple times in this document where they like talk about like, don't don't kill players or don't uh, don't bully players or don't like, you know, Basically, don't be over aggressive and stuff. And it's like, yeah, yeah, obviously. But like a DM is also a player. I would like I would like to I would like to crit. Oh, I can't crit in this game. Sedge. Yeah, you cannot. So it's like they're uh, like almost punishing you. Being a DM, and yeah. I feel like a lot of games are starting to do this now. Like I well, think the MCDM game also has like a, a mechanic like this. And it's like, why are you making it less fun to run the game? Make I don't, it more fun to run the game, so I will run it. Don't, don't de incentivize me to run the game. The fuck. I don't think the point is to make is to nerf the GM. I think the point is to have the GM side of the table feel feel and behave differently. And I don't think this necessarily makes it less fun to run the game. It's just different. I don't really think it's. I mean, okay, yeah, you can't crit. Whatever, you know, like that's not a big deal to me. Uh. I think it's but I like critting. just yeah. I mean, fine, whatever. You'll get over it. Like it's one little thing. No, I won't. I'll never get over it. I'll okay. never forgive them. Fine, stay in your little D and D corner, then, Matt. But point being, I, I don't think 
I'm about to say, I, don't yeah, tempt him. I, he will. He'll do I, it. I, I'm aware <laughs> he will. I think the point here is going to bring a ca- to character. Matt, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Let me finish the damn sentence. I've tried it three times now. No. I think the point of this is to make the two sides of the table feel different and for the GM side to be a little more chaotic and the hero side to feel a little more consistent because in terms of genre convention, which is to say heroic fantasy, the idea that the players are a little more consistently effective is sort of on genre. It makes sense in terms of the vibe they're going for. I mean, fucking stormtroopers exist for a reason. Right. That being said, the two different I feel like there's got to be another way to do it because the two different kinds of dice does feel conflicting in my brain like in my head that feels wrong for some reason it feels like that's I feels like there must be some other I don't know there's got to be another way to do that with the math I don't know what that other way would be but I feel like there should be some other way mm-hmm. what were just, you gonna yeah, say Isaiah? well what I was gonna say is it, it I'm not uh, you know, obviously, I'm not a, a statistician, so I can't tell you this like for a fact. Yeah, but it I just mean. seems kind of pointless because it's like, oh, well, you know, the the dungeon master has a more swingy die, but on average, characters have way lower evasion than like something like D and D, right? Like, uh, I made a level one rogue, and my AC is twelve, where in D and D that would be fourteen or fifteen. Uh, and you can use that same metric because they're using the same die, right? They are me, using the same them. die, but they're not using the two things they're not doing, though, is they're not using necessarily the same modifiers to the die and they're not using the same action economy. So it, it the, the math might balance itself out in terms of like you might be potentially attacking less or, this- you know, if modifiers aren't as good like it, there, there's some wiggle room there. It is still a D20. And yes, the evasion number is lower. But this is also worth pointing out. The evasion number might be lower, but then you still have the whole damage threshold system and the armor system, which sort of makes up for that. So it's the idea of like the GM might be hitting you more, but those hits might not matter because you could tank it. Stuff like that, you know? The, the yeah, GM I suppose. Only Although really that, rolls- that goes back. In- oh, sorry. Oh, is, that kind of goes back to what we were saying before uh, last week about like the whole damage threshold thing, maybe being kind of wacky and out of place in some areas. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I don't, th- my problem with the damage threshold system is that it feels, uh, overly complicated in a game. That's not trying to do that kind of thing very often. And it, and it, it, it's, I'm not clear on what the advantage of having it there is like what it's doing that makes the game feel more fun or more interesting. Um, but like it, it does f- from a math, from a purely mathematical sense, you know, it does work and make sense. You know what I mean? Mm. But from a game, a, a, a mouth feel, if you will. And by mouth feel, I mean the way the game feels to play. Maybe not so much. Matt. I was going to ask, um, the D 20, Yes. Like the DM only really rolls during combat, right? There's yes, like- yes. Which is which is good. Which is one thing that's good is you only have to worry about the weirdness of it during a fight. Mm. But, but that being said, the game does not have a distinct "we're now an initiative" thing. So it might feel confused. So, like, this is the thing, right? Okay. As someone, so as someone who's run the games that you know, as someone who's run a lot of Dungeon World Apocalypse World and End Blades, which this game is taking a whole bunch of stuff from, in those games, if the players try to do a thing and they fail, you as the GM react with repercussions. Right now, those repercussions may not be damage; they may just be you know, the character gets pushed down a fucking flight of stairs or whatever and like falls, but you don't necessarily damage them or whatever. But if you are dealing them damage, you don't do anything different. You just say, okay, uh, you know, you try to do something. The guy pushes you down the stairs. You take, you know, in Blades, you take one harm. In Dungeon World, you take a D10 of damage. In Apocalypse World, you take one harm. But you don't do anything different, right? You don't have to change the way the situation is, is. You don't have to change the way you're running your side of the table. 
But in Daggerheart, you go, okay, the guy pushes the guy down the stairs. Do I roll an attack for that against the player's evasion and them getting pushed down the stairs? Or do I not because we're not technically in combat, but the game doesn't really make any kind of hard distinction between combat and not combat because none of this this game and games of its style don't like there's no distinction between combat and not in Apocalypse World either. There's certain moves you use to attack people, but you're not there's no combat mode and non-combat mode like there is in D&D. So like do I roll the D20 to push them down the stairs or do I just narrate it fictionally and deal damage? You know, like you get into a little bit of a funky gray area. So it's like technically I'm only really using the D20 during combat, but sometimes that might get weird. I mean, actually I'm thinking about it now. I I don't. Yeah. Like I rarely rolled like dice unless it is combat or making. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Actually that that, now I'm thinking about it out loud and I'm like, wait, yeah, I mean, D&D, you don't do it so that that often. But in D&D, if you have a monster doing something, you will roll for them to make a check or whatever, you know, like especially if it's against a player, right? You will often have them roll in a game like this. You wouldn't even have them roll. The only thing you might do is tell the player to potentially roll something or even in Daggerheart, you might make what they call a reaction roll, which is a save. Um, But yeah, I, it, yeah, it's just funky. It's just I don't know. I don't necessarily have a better idea because I get because in the section about the GM die, they do explain why they're using it. I don't have a better idea on how you could do the same thing with also having the GM roll D12s. But yeah, using a D20, it has, it has bad mouth feel is the only way I could phrase it. No, I at least for now, it, it's at least it's a little bizarre. <laughs> Let, let, I will say this, at least for now, I, I I could end up running the game and actually like it. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like I may the mouthfeel may change once I like really put it, you know, pedal to the metal, as it were. We're going to yeah, find first. out. Like I said, like, we said this before, though, right? Like this is all first impressions. Yes. Uh, I'm just saying. All that being said, we then shift on to the making moves. Um, and this is the GM. So the way the GM interacts with the world in terms of, I mean, obviously the GM is sort of running the world, but in terms of responding to players, you make GM moves. Um, again, ripped directly from apocalypse world. Um, whoever is hilariously intoxicated at this point for taking shots. I'm sorry. I don't know how many you've taken at this point, but it's been a lot. (laughs) Um, (laughs) <laughs> don't play the drinking game for this episode I guess is really the moral of the story uh, <laughs> so yeah again it's ripped straight from those games the GM makes moves what is a GM move some people I think overthink this a little too much alright if you want to get really game design philosophy technically GMs are making moves in every single tabletop game ever made it's just not every game calls them out specifically Uh, but a GM move is just the players are doing something. I am reacting to them in kind by having the world do something in response to their actions. It's really all a GM Mm -hmm. move is at the end of the day. And then the game talks about soft and hard moves. A soft move is something that the players can sort of react to and is not immediately bad. A hard move is immediate consequences. So, for example, a soft move could be player. You're walking down a path. You see as a figure darts behind a tree and you see the glint of steel from the bush. There's something coming after. There's something about to attack you. There's a goblin in the bush. That would be a soft move because you're warning the player the goblin's there. Whereas a hard move would be, player, you're walking down the path. You take a step forward. You immediately feel a shoot of pain as a goblin archer shoots you in the leg with an arrow. You take one damage or whatever. What do you do? That would be a hard move because there's no, like, immediate... There's nothing the player could have done to sort of... Ahead of time. They just were hit with consequences. The idea is that you're supposed to start with soft moves and then go into hard moves, right? You're generally not supposed to just jump straight into a hard move with a couple of rare exceptions. You know, 
For example, you walk up to the door. You hear a bubbling, gurgling noise of a strange liquid, and the player opens the door. Oh, the room's filled with mag- magma. It would be a dick move, however, if you say, player, you open the door and fall into the magma. That would be a shit, shitty hard move to do, because you didn't... You just sort of left him hanging on that one. Uh, so, when do you do a move? It's pretty simple. If a player rolls with fear... You do a move, which is basically to say if the player does a bad, if the player failed, uh, rolls a failure, which, you know, that one's obvious. The player takes an action that has consequences. For example, the player, you give the player a warning. The player opens the door into the room filled with magma anyway. Then you do a GM move because they ignored your, your warning and they did an action that has consequences. They have now entered the room with magma. Um, a player gives you a golden opportunity. This is one of the ones a lot of people find weird a lot of the time. Gives you a golden opportunity is just that thing where the player looks at you and says, can I do this? And you as a GM go, yes. Yes, you can. You know, like, that's really all that means. Or when a player is like, you know, uh, I rush into the room with reckless abandon. Okay, well, that's a golden opportunity for me to attack you because you just said specifically with what reckless abandon. That's all a golden opportunity means. Um, And then looks to you. The last one is uh, whenever the players look to you for what happens next. Uh, Again, that one, some people maybe get confused, but it really is just like everyone's quiet at the table and they all turn and look you know, into your soul, expecting you to do a dance. You know, when all the players look at you and say, dance, monkey, dance, that's what that last one means, right? Like, what happens next? What happens next, GM? That kind of shit. Um, again, uh, you know, you, you said yes. dance, monkey, dance, and the only uh-huh. thing that came to mind was dance, water, dance, and then I went, God da- damn it, Dennis. Dance, water, dance. Uh, again, this list is <laughs> the same as the, the Apocalypse World one. I thought it was really funny that I you'll see I noted in my notes. Um, they even specifically said when a player gives you a golden opportunity, which is the exact same wording. And I thought that one in particular was just kind of funny. Um, they're really they're very much wearing their influence on their sleeve, you know. Um, and then the game talks a bit about like soft moves and hard moves and how that works. Um, I'm not obviously I just explained that whole situation. Um, It also breaks down each of the role types. So on a critical success, on a success with hope, success with fear, failure with hope and then failure with fear. uh, It gives you descriptions in the section about what all of those kind of mean and what you as the GM might say or do in response to those. Um. That one's one of those things. This is where adjudicating roles that are not binary in the way that D&D is, which is to say like pass fail. Adjudicating roles like this is often where people look at games like these and go, oh, this is going to be difficult for a newer GM to do because they, you know, they're going to have a hard time coming up with stuff on the fly or whatever. And I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be one hundo with you, Chief. I've played a lot of games with this system. I've listened to people talk about playing games with this system. It, I, I just don't think it's as hard as people feel like it is. <laughs> and I don't think it's something that's actually worth worrying about, because you'd be amazed how often and how quickly, if you just follow the logic and the fiction that is currently going on in your game, you will have an idea nine times out of ten something will come to mind and if you have no and if you really don't have an idea there's usually a couple of fallback answers you can go with so like in Daggerheart, the player rolls a success with fear right which is like they succeed but there's a cost and you as a player as you as a gm can't think of what a cost would be just tell them they succeed and to mark one or two stress that's it that's old reliable i can't think of something and mark stress you know like, yeah. I mean, there's, again, in other tabletops, like 
D and D, like eventually you learn how like varying degrees of success and failure are. Yeah. So like if you make like a DC, I don't know, like, let's just if say 15, 15 for an acrobatic check, yeah. and the player gets a 14, you can be like, you succeed, but you but, fucking you 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 scratch the shit out of your hands. You take a, I don't know, D6 right. damage or whatever. You know, it's it's the yes and but kind of failure, but moving forward. Yes. There's a, there's an uh, there's a Matt Colville video on this I think yes. too where he talks about this because it's it's not it's not actually that's the thing like people get really like stressed out about this and think that it's gonna make GM GMing way way harder and I think people just underestimate their ability to like think of stuff on the fly you know yeah. it's but, it's just not that bad it just really isn't I. I like and I I, I'm you, speaking you, from experience here, you know. Like same, but I will I will just kind of like playing devil's advocate. You don't have to do this for every role. Not every role you need right. like well, five degrees of like success or failure. Sometimes it's okay if a role is just a fail or a success. Well, don't do it all the time. But sometimes I think it it's okay. It's not you. You don't have to do it for every every fucking role. Here's what I'll say to that though. Because the game does tell you to do it for every roll. So if you're sort of beholden and, and you know, uh, playing the game rules as written, you are supposed to do it for every roll. But that's where you fall back on the what I just said, Matt, where you use the old reliables, right? I can't really think of anything. I don't want to do anything for this particular role. Okay, mark stress or gain a hope or, you know... Or clear a stress in this game, you know, stuff like that, where you have a couple True, of old reliable ones that are for the lower impact stuff. And if it's something yeah. really, really low impact, then just don't roll. That's that's one of the things the game talks about. Like that's D and D. You will sometimes make rolls for things that aren't that impactful, but in games like Daggerheart, you really, really, really only ask for dice if it matters. Like. No rolling to take a piss. Like, you should never roll to take a piss, but in this game especially, just don't have them roll if it really isn't going to matter. You know what I mean? Just just toss it out. I forget which... So the th- I was going to say, the thing I really wanted to bring up, uh, and I, I... I don't think it's perfect, but I do like that this game gives you... Uh, you know... It, on paper, it's three successes, two failures. Realistically, it's two failures, two successes, one kind of neutral. You know what I mean? Yes. I do enjoy this more than games like Apocalypse World and Dungeon World, because in those games, I've, I've complained about this before, where it's it's you have critical success and then success with something fails and then fails and then critical fails. No, you don't. Which I, I dislike. It seems um, skewed. Wait, and wait, yes, wait. I, hold on, wait. You don't have that in Apocalypse World. I just don't. So you have a critical success. No, you don't. You have a standard success, which is no, no, no. There's no critical success in Apocalypse World. There's no critical failure either. There's only success, middling, and then fail. Uh, fair enough. Yeah. So you, you have success, partial success, and failure. Yes. Um. That's it. Fair enough. I still am not a fan of that. It because it or I, although to be fair, the reason why I'm not a fan of it is in games like Apocalypse World, the Dungeon World. It's really it's way harder to just get a success on something to just get to just do it right. There always has to be a catch. It or, or majority of the time it's going to be a catch or it. Eh. Well, not not if you're rolling your best stat. The way the math works out is you're going you're you're likely to get a middling success unless you are rolling something with a plus two or more, in which case you are far more likely to just succeed. And as the game goes on, those stats will get better, less so in Apocalypse World, but definitely in Dungeon World, because your stats actually go up more in that game. Uh, as you get later into the game, your your uh, failure rate drops drastically. So, it not always. I don't know. I, we played quite a bit of power uh not power uh, blades in the dark which blades in the dark different doesn't have the same math because remember blades in the dark uses dice pool i guess i don't know 
It, 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 it's very, Blades uses very different math for that situation. Blades, you're intentionally supposed to fail more often because Blades is supposed to feel like more of an uphill battle because of the type of genre that Blades is, right? The whole point of Blades is that you're a bunch of shitty scoundrel nobodies trying to move up in the world. So it's, it's an, it's an uphill battle for a really long time until you get to late game. That's by design. But Apocalypse I World suppose, and Dungeon I don't World, think it so works. Much. Uh, well, but fair enough. That's the intended concept. That's why. That's why in Blades no, you're I going know. to I, get. I, 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 fair enough. I I don't. I think that concept is flawed, on a, on just a simple logic basis. But like, fair enough. What do you mean on a simple logic basis? Well, so if the idea is that this, the the deck is stacked against you. Yes, but you wouldn't be in your position as like a, a, at least a partially success. Like, let's say you're a pickpocket, right? If you're a pickpocket, yep. to even have a starting character, you need to be at least somewhat good at pickpocketing. You can't just be someone who's picked up the skill yesterday, yes. which would mean in something like that, you are bound to succeed more than you failed because by nature of being a player character, you are more skilled in that thing than pretty much anybody else in your general vicinity. But you do. That should be the thing that you... Huh? You do succeed more than you fail in Blades. It's just that you succeed with a cost. But you do succeed. That's more than that's you the fail. issue. It, like that, that's what I'm saying. Is like that. That to me does not pass a smell test. I'm not saying that you should succeed all the time or even most of the time. I just feel like it should be more down the middle. But in terms of consequence. But it is because the idea is that you're getting what you want, but there's a cost. But the whole point of the middle success role is that the, the GM is not supposed to take away the success of what you were trying to attempt. They're just supposed to tack on a bad thing in addendum, but they're never ever supposed to take away the success. Right, That's the whole idea. You are succeeding. You're still succeeding at the end of the day. You know what I mean? I guess, I don't know. Like it's, it, the, the, the thought wasn't fully formed. It was just sort of a well, well, what I as you can tell, the thought wasn't fully formed, but it just. Yeah. <laughs> well, what I mean is like, so if you're making a role in Blades or Apocalypse World or any of them, right, and you get a middling success, let's say you're trying to like the the classic. Uh, this is very this is more fantasy than Blades, but whatever. You know, you're trying to scale. Uh, let's say you're trying to scale a building, right? You're you're a, you're a thief. Uh, what's it called? A skulk or whatever in Blades. You're you're one of the the sneaky guy. I can't remember. Um. You're trying to scale a building, uh, right? Leech. Thing. No, it's not the leech. I forget what the. Oh, no, no, no. Leech is the show. Is the like face? Yeah. Uh, no, that's spider. Anyway, doesn't matter. <laughs> spider. Yeah. Um, you're trying to climb up the building, and you roll. Uh, you roll a four or five, which is the middle success. You know, a middling success result in blades. The GM's not supposed to say you get halfway up the building and then grab a windowsill and the windowsill breaks and you fall. That's not a middling success, right? The GM's supposed to say, you climb the building. You have successfully scaled the building. You're on the roof. But there's a dude on the roof with you that, that you didn't know about. That would be the middling success. You get what you want, but now you have a new problem you have to deal with. There's also a guy on the roof. That's how it's supposed to work. Now, again, this can obviously become a problem if you have a GM who's being a little mean or whatever and is like, takes a middling success and treats it basically like a failure, which they're not supposed to, that can be an issue. But assuming, as as the D&D creator said, we don't design for assholes, the idea is you climb the building and then something else happens. So you're still succeeding, and in Blades you're succeeding a majority of the time, and Blades also gives you a secondary option which is the resist roll, which is, oh no, something's bad's gonna happen, but I'm a lucky scoundrel I'm just going to not have the bad thing happen to me. And you could do that pretty reliably to a point in Blades, obviously, because you run out of stress eventually. Um, and if you get particularly lucky, you can do stuff like that more often. So it's supposed to be a balance of like you're fighting an uphill battle, but also you are kind of a lucky criminal. And then also in the situations where you aren't fighting an uphill battle, because I don't know if you remember the effect system in that game, uh, Isaiah, but if you're dealing with somebody who's sort of below you in skill, then even a failure means very little to you. So like 
if you're a tier two character fighting a tier zero thug, they're going to have little effect on you and you're going to have or, or more correct to say you're going to have very little risk for your role and you're going to have great effects. So even if you fail the role, the worst they're going to do is like nick you a little bit and you're going to be annoyed, but they're not going to like deal a harm or whatever, you know. So there is also that sliding scale, too. Now, Dungeon World and Apocalypse Zero don't have the effect sliding scale, but they have. But, you know, same kind of idea. But yes, you are supposed to f- succeed, in, and in Daggerheart too, you are supposed to succeed more than you fail. That is, that is at and, the end of the day. The yes, and, and like I said, I think it's, I think it's more successful in Daggerheart because you have a non-critical, you just succeed situation. I think uh, that is like important for me. You kind of, well, I guess. I mean, I guess a success with. Yeah, I mean, you have success with hope. Yeah. But you do, again, though, you do still have that in Blades. You can roll a six and get a full success and be totally clear. You know, like, it's not impossible. No, it's not. But it, Daggerheart gives you a critical success. No matter what, you did it. Congrats. No matter how much the deck is stacked against you, you pull it off. And then you have a, well, you got what you were looking for. You <laughs> did it right. There's nothing really. This won't bite you later. Or this, this doesn't have the potential mm. to bite you later. And you have success with fear, which is, but it's less likely. It is numerically less likely, but it's still there. So that's the thing I, I, there's also still crits in blades, which actually apocalypse world doesn't have. How do the crits work? Oh, you need the, what is it? Double sixes. Yeah, that's it. Double sixes. If you roll two sixes on a roll, you get a crit. Um, I suppose, like I said, I don't know. It, to me, it just feels like it's done better here than I've seen it in other systems trying to do the same thing. It feels more. Well, you also I don't want to say fair, but it, it feels more neutral on things. Well, you also have to take into account that this game is a different genre, that this is heroic fantasy. The players are supposed to feel more powerful than the enemy. Which is not the uh, case. Yes, but so something like this to me doesn't even feel like heroic fantasy. It just feels like it makes sense. It, it feels I mean, more it, realistic. It, like, and I'm, I'm not saying the genre, I'm saying this specific system on success and fail feels more in line with what makes sense to me on a just reason basis. There are some times where you can like completely nail something more often than not, you're either going to get it right or, you know, kind of do it right, but you fucked up somewhere and then you fail it or there you really blow it like. I I, I I I don't I feel like we're getting in a circular logic scenario because I, I I fail to see it doesn't look that different than the other games. The only difference here that I'm seeing is that because Daggerheart is heroic fantasy, it is tilting the die or it's tilting the the probability a little bit more in the player favor than Apocalypse World or Blades do because those games aren't supposed to be heroic. The characters are supposed to be getting beat up more. So this game just tilted a little more in player favor, which you can, I mean, if, at the end of the day, if you just like the game being more in, a little bit more in the player favor, that's fine. But I don't know that well, we can so, say yeah, one that, is that's like, what I'm saying is that I, I, it to me, I, well, like I said, it, from in my internal logic, it doesn't even really feel like it's favoring the player more. It is, it is. I mean, but it doesn't is. feel like the scale is higher in the player's favor, right? It just goes from not in the player's favor to a net neutral. I, yeah, I mean, I think that's where I disagree with you. I think it, 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 I don't think it's a net neutral. I think it is in the player favor. I think that's, we can disagree on that. That's, that's, that's what I'm getting at. And again, like, obviously you're, it's fine to like that more. Although I, I don't know the word realistic. I don't know if you should use that phrase because that, that gets into some. No, I mean, yes, not really. This is, uh, to me, it follows a, a a more sound reason than realistic, I guess. I guess. Matt, you still alive over there? Yes, sir. That's it. All you got for me? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't really have an issue with the with the system. Uh, I don't. Know, but three out of five are good. Basically, yes. Yeah. Three, three, so three out of the five are in player favor. 
two two are not and even the one that and then even the fourth one which is not in player favor still gives the player something to utilize that will help them gain player it's the favor middle of the road one yeah it's kind of not even middle of the road the hope. yeah it's almost not like, it's like it is so it's uh, let me rephrase that it's middle of the road in the moment if you fail with hope because you're like well i fail but i get a consolation prize but yeah. that consolation prize can be used to give you greater chance of success down the road yeah activate which, your powers and all yeah that which yeah. tilts it even further in your favor that's why it's probably more of a neutral because it's like you know there's the cost. This is, you know, you fail yeah. the roll, but you get, yeah, like you said, a it's almost process. not. Yeah, it's like almost not. It's almost like it almost to me. It almost feels like failure with fear is the only uh, true failure. You done fucked up, eh, Ron? Yeah. yeah, like that's the only <laughs> one that feels like true failure uh, among this list. I mm. almost that's I, fair. That's in. I, I agree with you there. No, no, like now that I'm looking at it again with Matt Matt's input, I do agree. Um, Maybe that means that there should be just a you fail and then there's nothing else. It's just a fail. It is what it is, you know? Um, um I guess yeah, they're, I don't, they're so, trying to do something slightly different or at least build upon the this notion of the f- degrees of success and failure. They are. That, I, like you see in other games. I, I did have a thought as I was reading through this game that I almost kind of wish there was one at least one outcome where neither fear or hope are generated that's kind of yeah so that that's kind of what i mean right like because you yeah. have a success where there's no hope where there's no um oh no it, it, you know you still do get a hope right if you succeed yeah. with hope you just no, get it's, a hope it's yeah it's always that's the thing it's always 50 oh, 50 so you every know roll I, I wasn't really either. taking that into account yeah all right fair enough i wasn't taking the you will get a hope if you succeed with which I should have. It literally says it in the name, but it's not described in that section as you get a hope. You know what I mean? It's just you succeed. It is what it is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I that's what I mean. I, I all I almost. Yeah. The fact that it's 50 50 and there's every single role, no matter what, is going to give you a hope or a fear. Right. There's no null scenario. I do feel like maybe there should be a null. I just don't know what that would look like. But I do kind of because. Man, it it feels like it's just really hard to balance. Again, I think this one will this one will really pan out when we play, but I feel like it's hard to balance a game around this idea that you're always getting a resource on one side or the other, like I don't know. That just seems like it could be. It's going to get tricky eventually. Like almost too, not too much to keep track of because it's not hard to keep track of, but too much to. I don't know. Too, too many plates to spin or something. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, Yeah, I I see what you're saying. And I think later on, I'm going to have, I'm going to bring this up again because this was something else I was thinking about. um, When we get into like deeper into the combat stuff. (laughs) Yeah. Um, yeah. And just sort of as a hint to it, it's the book describes like, oh, you know, you as the DM, you know, you have these fear points, but you're not supposed to use them all the time. And it's like, what? You know what I mean? And it, in because it, yeah. obviously you can use them for more than just making the player's life harder, right? You use the fear points, for example, as uh, use yeah, them as you action use them tokens a lot in, the, in, combat. in the initiative. You, you spend two you to like them. interrupt you can, people. Yeah. No, you spend yeah. so you spend two to convert them into an action token, which you yeah, can yeah. then use. Oh, I, okay. yeah. You yeah. also use them okay. to like clear. I, I guess I'll, I'll get into it kind of now, and I'll get into it. I well, guess again later, but um. <sighs> But the, the whole thing where you can use fear to generate an action token to allow you to, like, clear a status effect, but you're not supposed to clear it right away. You know, it's like oh, a, that particular kind of goes into what yeah. Matt was talking about, where it makes the game less fun for you because you sort of have to. You shouldn't be a mean DM, but that doesn't mean you're not allowed to be mean just a little bit. You know what I mean? Like, it's a yeah. give and take. You're not you're you're allowed to just. Just pour on a little salt every now and again, a little sriracha here and there. But the game's like, no, no. Yes. No, no. So what what? Yeah. The part you're talking about is that uh, you can spend a fear to clear a status effect. 
And but yeah, it says don't even if you have a lot of fear, don't necessarily clear a status effect immediately because that makes the player feel like they did that for no reason. And it's kind of the D&D thing of player uses spell, boss uses legendary resistance, player is sad. But, you know, yes, here's I, the thing. I get it, but that's the... Hold, the on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Here's the thing. The reason I get why they're... I kind of get why they're saying it is because of what we were just talking about. Because the die roll is always a 50-50... You're going to have fear all the time. You're probably almost never going to have zero fear. So if you just use it all the time to mitigate what the players are doing, you're going to mitigate everything they do. And the players are going to be basically just completely useless. You know, like you're going to be mitigating it so often because of how much fear you're going to have because it's always a 50 50. So it's like. Actually, technically, and the game points this out. Technically, there's a slightly lower chance to generate fear than there is hope, technically, because a critical success generates hope and there is no critical failure. So you have a slightly higher. It's 44 percent. I think they said 44 percent chance to generate fear versus the hope. But anyway. Yeah, like it, it feels weird to be like, let your monster intentionally have the status debuff. But at the same time, because you're basically never going to have any, uh, you're never going to have a shortage of fear, kind of get why they're saying that. And I'm not saying this is a good solution to the problem, but I do understand why they're saying it. Because the thing in D&D, right, Legendary Resistance, the boss only has three to five. So the players can burn through them. And then once the players have burned through them, they can go, all right, now we can hammer the boss. But in Daggerheart, there's no way to burn through it because the GM's going to be generating fear all the time. And in a fight, you're going to be rolling more often than when you're just out and about. So there's going to be even more fear and hope bouncing back and forth during a fight than there would be normally. So the GM's really not going to have any fear, like not going to have a shortage of fear. You know well, what I mean? True. I, I actually thought of an answer to this. Potentially two. Okay. Uh, and the idea would be is kind of like Legendary Resistance, let it, uh, let's say it takes, oh, rotated away from my mic. Let's say it takes one fear three times uh, an encounter for like, uh, I can't, what are they called? The leader adversary, right? The boss. Yeah. Yeah. Takes one fear and they can clear a condition and they can do that a number of times equal to some sort of stat. Yeah. Just give right? it an ammo count. Yeah. Yeah. And then with each one, it, let's say it's three fear. Or the other thing you can do, which. I think works even a little bit better is every time you want to repeat an action on a boss to show that that boss is getting tired, just like the player is have it cost one fear more per thing. Oh, and so obviously it costs you two, leave some out three, like attack. Four. Yeah. And obviously the stuff, stuff like attacks don't increase that. Right. That's right. a little goofy, but when it comes to clearing a condition, uh, like let's say you're fighting like, like Lord Soth, right. And his whole thing is, he just has this like sundering attack where he can knock you clean on your ass with like a really heavy horizontal slash. Okay, cool. He does that. Let's say he does that five times in a row. And then he does it, but it does like maybe it pushes you back a little bit. It doesn't actually knock you on your back like originally. To sort of describe that that character is getting tired. They're losing the ability to fight with as much zeal as they had before. I think that would work better. And that would also allow you to be like, oh, yes, we're going to paralyze him. Oh, but it's Lord Soth. So he breaks the paralysis immediately. It's like and you hit him again and then he slowed down a little bit, you know, like or or you simply say you hit him again and it would cost him so many fear tokens to to get rid of the paralysis. He just can't afford it. Yeah, right? yeah. like if the it, cost it, keeps like, building, yeah. eventually he won't be able to do it. Like if you get up to the point where it costs seven fear to clear the paralysis, he's probably not clearing it. <laughs> you know what I mean? True, and that by that point, your players are probably running really low on hope. Like, that would be the, uh, well, not necessarily low, but the well, idea not, would not be they're, low, but they're they're burning through stuff. Yeah, they're burning through their domain cards. They're burning through their class abilities, shit like that. Mm -hmm. Honestly, um, <laughs> I think the answer is is kind of is is pretty simple. In just take away because the ability to spend a fear to clear a condition is like a general rule you can use on anybody take it away as a general rule and just make it a move on stat blocks for monsters that you think should have it, you know? And then for everybody else, maybe give the option to like 
just, you know, roll to break out of it or whatever or something like that. You know what I mean? Or because like you could also do, oh, uh, if you you paralyze this monster um, once th- once you once three action tracker action tokens have been placed on the tracker, the monster is no longer paralyzed. Right. It, it lasts effectively like three actions. You could do something like that. Right. If you're going to have this fucking action tracker system, which I don't want, but let's say we're using it. You can use those those tracker points for a bunch of things and they already and they already are using those tracker points for a bunch of abilities that monsters activate so why not also have it be like based around the player's abilities you know yeah i think there's lots of ways you could potentially do it but the idea of basically play unoptimally and let your monster get slapped around a little bit is not a great answer (laughs) it's kind of whatever i mean it's it's a answer, but yeah, I don't love it. <laughs> um, okay. But let it ever be said, I'm not equal opportunity. Like, make <laughs> right. things I a mean, little bit more yes. balanced for the players, but also make things more fun for the DMs. I mean, I, Matt, you got a two cents to throw in on that one? Uh, it. Sorry, I like brain farting yeah. super hard yeah. right there. Yes. You're yes. killing me, Smalls. Yes, yeah. what, Matt? Yes, what? Yeah. All right, we're moving on. We're moving on. <laughs> um. Uh, oh, I will say a nice little uh, tidbit because the book uh, we weren't on. Uh, we stopped talking about the section we were talking to go back to the section we were on um, where the book is talking about GM moves. Um, the book lists the GM moves in order of softer to harder, which uh, giggity giggity. Um. I just like that. That's a good little organizational touch that as you go down the list of GM moves, they go, they become more and more hard moves. Big fan of that. Just a good way to organize it. I don't think Apocalypse World did it that way. So nice little touch. Um, And then it talks about, oh, and then it literally talks about not doing the thing I was just saying of undermining a success, right? On a success with feel with fear, one pitfall new GMs can run into is undermining the player's success with a GM move that they make as a consequence. Uh, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> don't do the thing I said where you climb the building and you fall down. That's not a success. You climb the building and then there's a guard on the building. You still climb the building. You still succeed. Um, then it gets into fear stuff. Uh, a little bit. Um, oh, I completely forgot the GM actually has a fear cap. That's funny. Yeah, actually, I I completely missed that too on my yeah, first read. I complete. I, I I did read that and forgot. Yeah, the fear. The GM has a fear cap of ten. Um, Which most people, from what I've watched, I've watched a couple of <laughs> videos of people talking about running the game. And the biggest complaint, well, one of the sorry, not the biggest complaint, but one of the a many complaint. complaints I've been hearing, is that. Even after combat, the GM has so many fear tokens. The players have so many hope tokens. That's just like, wh- what do now? Yeah, I've done everything. I guess I'll just throw a colossal dragon at them and spend all my tokens like the fuck. Yeah, I, I, I do think maybe that cap should be lower. Maybe it should be five. Because again, you're generating them 50 50 on every roll. Yeah. So like, it's kind of OK if the cap is lower because they're always coming in. And actually, actually, they're coming in for the GM more often than the players, because when a player generates hope, the hope point is only for that one player. Every fear, every roll with fear, right? If you have four players, they're all rolling. Your chance of gaining fear is greater than any one of the players chances of gaining hope, because all of their roles contribute to your pool, but all of their roles don't necessarily contribute to all individually. Yeah. yeah. They only go individually. Mm. So yeah, the GM's going to have fear coming in more often than any one player is going to have hope coming in. Yep. So yeah. Yeah. I think that, that, that cap probably should go down by at least half. You might even (laughs) be able to bring it down to like three, to be honest, maybe four. Well, you probably want to do four because you can convert two fear tokens for an action token. So maybe do four. But like, yeah, that's kind of funny. Hmm. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and it, it it says the main way you're the the most common use of fear is to augment something you're already doing and make it more difficult. Which, like, yeah, sort of, but it seems like the what they really mean by that is the most common way to spend fear is in combat on special abilities. That's really what that means, because augmenting your normal GM moves doesn't necessarily seem to be the case with the fear stuff. You know? Yeah. Um, the the one thing where I'm looking at it where it says when you spend fear, you can, and it gives yeah, you like it a gives list. Yeah, it gives a big list. Me. Yeah. Yeah, I like this, but the one that sticks out to me that's like, why is this here is the tick a countdown? Yeah. I, 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 shouldn't that just be a thing you <sighs> do in the background as a GM anyways? Yes, like, no. yeah. Yeah, okay. So I think what they're... Yeah, okay, so to go over the list that Matt just mentioned, so there's a, there's a list that says when you spend fear, you can, and then it gives a list and it says do something big, Take a countdown, use an adversary's fear move, take advantage on a roll, end an effect, clear a condition, add an additional add an additional d6 of damage, add two tokens to the action tracker. Isn't it one token? Isn't it one token to the action tracker? Uh, Isn't it two fear for one token? Yeah, interrupt PCs take two a- two action. Uh, yeah, two fear on the bottom there. And then interrupt PCs to take an action. Two. No, that's a separate thing. Oh, two shit. different bullet points. Oh, fuck. it says add two tokens to the action tracker, but doesn't it? Ca- it, it shouldn't say one token because it says right above. If you don't have fear to spend while well, the action tracker is active, oh you can no, always, you're giving the players two token that you okay. can always convert two character tokens on the action tracker to one fear. Oh, it's the other way around. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. okay. Oh, okay. So you can. Oh, okay. I see. I see what it's saying. You can spend a fear to add two tokens, or you can convert two tokens to a fear. It goes vice versa. Um, but so yeah. is that to say you remove two char- two characters from the character tokens and add a fear for yourself? You remove two. T- yeah, you remove two tokens and then gain a fear. Gain one point of fear. Or you can, Maybe, so, or you can yeah, okay, burn yeah, one right. point of fear to get two tokens. How you would that go both ways? Maybe I, I may have missed it, but how, how do, do they talk about that? Like, how is that represented in game? Is either, it's either you, you use a fear and do something you, big. Well, I was going to say it's, it's like you use a fear and then two more gamooks show up. How does the opposite manifest? Not two more gamooks, just two more actions that the gamooks who are already there can do ah okay it doesn't it's not ca- to- token the action tokens are not one to one with character count right so like when a player does an action you the gm puts a token on the tracker all four players do something there's four tokens but the gm only has one boss monster the boss monster can spend all of those tokens on just himself. It's not it's not a monster count. Copy. Did you think it was a monster count? I may have. OK, <laughs> yeah. See, the- <laughs> oh, man, the fucking action token system. Look, it's and, yeah. a bit of a mess. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm, yeah. I, it's also a little bit of a mess because parts of the book conflict with themselves. But yeah, so. Yeah, I mean, I don't think they talk about how that's represented fictionally, but the idea is just that if you have an abundance of fear, you can burn it to gain tokens. If you have abundance of tokens, you can burn it to gain fear. Like the idea is just it it gives you an ability to manipulate your own resource pool. Because you have two different resource pools, which I think is kind of inherently part of the problem. Um so yeah, that's that's the list there. Uh, the countdown thing, Matt. I mean, yes, comma. However, the one situation where I think spending the fear to burn a countdown makes a little bit more sense is again in combat because yeah, I can, I... monsters have countdown abilities. So like the dragons like rearing up their fire breath, it takes a certain number of actions before they can use it. So spending fear to speed up the pace at which the dragon can use their fire breath. That's Mm. the situation where it makes sense. But yes, in terms of the countdowns, because like the count, there is the countdown clock system. I actually like in this game. What a surprise, because it's just basically the countdown system from blades. Shocker. Mm. Um, 
yeah, when you're dealing with countdown clocks in in the world and like stuff going on in the background, no, yeah, I I, I don't feel like you really should need to spend fear to make those move along. Um, but again, in combat, it does make sense. Honestly, the, most of this list use an adversary's fear move, take advantage on a roll, end in effect, clear condition, add damage. Most of this list is combat, right? Like, yeah. Except for the first two. This is basically all the the list is all things you can spend fear on that will affect combat. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of mostly what fear is for. Because <laughs> the funny thing is, it says take advantage on a roll, and you're like, oh well, you can take advantage on a roll at any time, and then you remember that the only time the GM rolls is when they're attacking. No oh, You don't roll any other time, so that's a combat ability, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um. It then breaks down that list as it did before, which is just, you know, explaining each of the various ways to spend fear. We don't need to get into that. And then we get into the action tracker stuff. Okay. (laughs) My brain. Clearly, I didn't read this correct because I was confused as shit. Yeah. So here's the thing, though, Isaiah. I was confused too. I had to reread it and I watched the video and I saw someone else talking about it and then I got it. So, <laughs> Jesus, that's bad. <laughs> to be very clear, this is how it works the action tracker hits the table anytime the GM feels like it is going to be an extended combat, which is to say, you know, more than one or two rolls. Right? Okay. GM's like, all right, the players are fighting the boss dragon. Action tracker hits the table. Obviously, the fight with the dragon isn't going to be resolved in a single roll. Players. All right. Uh, trackers down. The dragon begins to lumber towards the, pl- the four of you. What do you do? Players begin doing their various actions to attack the dragon. Player one says, I do X, Y, and Z. Okay. Okay. Action token goes on the action tracker. Player two does X, Y, and Z. Token goes on the tracker. Player three does something. Token goes on the tracker. Player four does something. Token goes on the tracker. There are now four tokens on the action tracker. The GM says, okay, I am going to now spend tokens to make the dragon do something. Because it's a boss dragon and he can do multiple moves in a row... I'm going to spend three tokens to have him do three different actions. So one of them's an attack. One of them's like he flies up and grabs somebody. One of them, you know, whatever tail swipe doesn't matter. Mm. Uh, Once the GM has gone through the tokens that they have used, the players then essentially get the initiative back and can start doing stuff also. The GM can also kind of basically the GM can also interrupt them partway through by using fear to generate themselves some tokens and also stop the players. Basically, you could spend two fear by and the two fear would interrupt a player and then also give you two action tokens to do something with the monster. That is how that works. Mm. I see. So we're planning on doing a a, a, like a, a small thing for this you're gonna yeah. have to explain this then because i i got it but, but you like, don't got kinda. it yeah i know yeah I, know. I get it uh if you watch the one shot that they ran it, it might help a little bit but yeah basically the idea is the the sort of the, the sort of mechanical design concept is that every time a player does something that gives the gm some ammo that they have in their back pocket to do something in return in the future And the idea is supposed to be that if you think about it in a sort of cinematic fashion, the camera is focused on all the cool stuff the players are doing. And then the camera goes, "Okay, now it's the villain's turn and we focus on the villain for a little while. And the tokens are the way that the GM keeps the camera focused on the villain and lets the villain, uh, you know, be a be the aggressor. Mm. It it, it is a it. The game says that it's not, but like it's an initiative system. I so I just want to because I I don't know if you guys watched. uh, There was a video. uh, I forgot what the fuck the YouTube channel. I I posted D20 combat 
yeah. where they were comparing the MCDM game initiative versus the Dagger Heart initiative versus just regular 5e initiative. Uh -huh. And after listening to all that, and it's like, man, I, I really, I don't understand why people have such a hate boner for basic D D initiative. Okay, I get it if you want to do something different, like oh, you just go around the table if you're playing in you know physical, but for like if you're playing digitally, the MCDM version of like okay, all the players go, and then the bad guys go, and then the players go. It's like. For me, it's like, I don't like that because like they, you know, the players are either going to supernova, which, you know, then for a later combat, sure, that, that might work out more in my favor. But for that one fight, I don't get a turn. I remember, the DM's a player, too. And then for Daggerheart, it also kind of seems like there are instances where DM's might not just get a turn to do anything. Okay. Granted, it's probably uh, not likely because it's not likely. Yeah. It's not likely because more players can probably roll. Someone's gonna roll fear. It's literally 50 50. Right. Someone's gonna, Someone's roll, gonna fear, roll fear. But, and and also remember those middling successes are still an opportunity for you to do kind of something. True, but it's also then it seems like it's such a for Dagheart the biggest thing is it's such a disorganized mess. It is. Yes. Because it's like, well, who goes? I don't know. I was near the monster. So I guess well, I'll go. Okay. And then it's like, well, why not <laughs> go right. around the table? And then it's like, oh, no, we can't do that. And it's like, okay, how about who has the highest agility? Oh, we can't do that. Cause it's right. like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Matt, 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 Matt. Yeah. I, I yeah. feel like you are getting the worst. <laughs> this is the thing that frustrates you. People are going to look at this and think that a game that doesn't have an initiative system doesn't work. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying this one doesn't work. No, no, I know. Because this here's this is what annoys me. This is what annoys me about this game. This problem was already solved. Dungeon World, Apocalypse World, Blades. None of those have initiative systems. They mm. already solved this problem. When the player does a roll, the enemy reacts to the roll. It's a one-to-one -one basic back and forth. If... So mm. I was going to I was going to talk about I was going to bring this up later, but there's a there's a section a little bit further down that that um, talks about uh, the act. It does a summary on the action tracker system. Mm. OK. Yeah. Mo so the move system exists already in Apocalypse World. What are you? I, you can literally scroll down and see my notes. I literally wrote. What is the point of having me spend action tokens to activate enemies when the failure or partial success of a move should already dictate that? It feels like an extra step that will give the GM confusion with no clear benefit. And to give you an example, I literally copied and pasted how it works in Dungeon World. This is the freight. This is the, the move hack and slash in Dungeon World. This is what it says. And hack and slash is your sort of primary way that you would like attack a monster, right? When you attack an enemy, roll with plus strength. On a 10 plus, you deal your damage to the enemy and avoid their attack. At your option, you may choose to add an additional d6 of damage, but expose yourself to the enemy attack. On a 7 to 9, you deal your damage to the enemy, and the enemy makes an attack against you. Done. If you fail the roll, you don't get to do shit diddly, and the enemy gets to slap your shit around because that's implied by the move system already. Mm. I I kind of feel like this is... Uh, Josh, you, you'll you know this because you also read the Aragon books as a kid. Uh, uh, it's like uh, the people comparing Aragon to like knock off Lord of the Rings and Star Wars. And then <laughs> by the fourth book, he went, fine, fuck it, I'm going to write my own book. And it was completely different. And you're like, oh. Um, it kind of feels like they are like ripping from all these tabletop... These other but games, trying to do their own thing. And then... In the last minute, they're like, fine, we'll make our own rules. Yeah. And we'll have blackjack and hookers. Yeah. And then it actually doesn't. Kind of. But like, weird, <laughs> weird analogy, but I see where you're going with it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, like the, the dungeon world, like the dungeon world hack and slash move already tells you what you need to do. If the character rolls a 10 plus, which is a complete success, they attack the enemy and face no repercussions. If they roll a seven to nine, they face repercussions. It's built in 
boom, bang, boom. The GM doesn't need to spend any points or use a resource or anything. The GM simply narrates, all right, you know, fighter, you attack the goblin, the goblin attacks you back. That's it. What? Why, why does Daggerheart... Because Daggerheart already uses the move system for other stuff. Why doesn't it just use that for combat? Because it, like... This action token thing, I don't, I don't see what the, like, I don't see how it's making the game any better. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just like not, I just don't get it. I just don't see, I just don't see, I don't know. I don't necessarily, I, I, I think they, I guess what it is, is they tried to solve a problem that wasn't a problem is kind of what it feels like. Like, it feels like they invented yeah. a problem to then solve the problem. <laughs> Yeah, it's the same yeah, with combat. It, it does kind of feel like I'll go for, go for it. we don't want to do normal initiative. We want to do it our way, the better way. And then you're kind of like, is it though? Yeah, but it's not. It's like, the, you, you, yeah, for, you know what this feels like? Genuinely. Mm -hmm. It's like we don't like algebra. And then uh -oh. they invented calculus. You know, it's like shit. Yeah. <laughs> There's what? just like there's no universe where this is a more streamlined situation than either D and D's uh, initiative or uh, yeah, D and D's uh, uh, fucking power by the apocalypse's like freeform system or like we said last time the Genesis system somewhat freeform you roll your initiative but then it becomes the players get to choose how when and they act you know yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, we could we could spend hours on different initiative systems, so I'm not going to necessarily go down that rabbit hole. I just think this just feels like a weird over designy mess and it should probably get thrown out. Um, but it's probably not going to because it's pretty baked into the game at this point. I also want to point out a little thing uh, that I made a note of. Uh, it says in the action tracker system that the presence of the action tracker doesn't have to mean violence is only is the only option. But because it's kind of a pseudo initiative tracker, that's going to make players think that means it's fighty time. Right? Like mm -hmm. this is a problem people have in D&D &D, where like once the initiative hits the board, everyone assumes the only option is to fight. And so you're like, oh, the action tracker doesn't have to mean a fight, but like it kind of does mean a fight because it just kind of ha it's it's just how it's going to feel. That's like what it's for. So it's like, I don't know. I think that's the that's my other problem with the whole situation is that they're trying to claim they're like, our game doesn't have an initiative system, but like it does. It just it totally does. <laughs> just say don't don't just say it does. It's OK. It's okay. It's almost like you want them to do the the Obi Wan Kenobi. There's no initiative system from a certain point of view. Like right from a certain yeah exactly. So yeah, I mean that's just that's just I if it were me, I'd throw out the action I throw out the action tracker system. Uh, have it operate the way Blades or Apocalypse World operates in terms of combat. And then all of the monster abilities, which we're going to get to in a minute, have those just trigger based off fear. That's it. You know? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I did make a note, and I thought this is kind of interesting. I don't necessarily know if it tells us. And I'm not now, of course, I'm not going to be able to find it, probably. Um, but it mentions. Where is it? Uh, oh, here. Wait. OK. If the attack miss no. Oh yeah. One thing that I found really weird, if you scroll to the section of attack rolls right at the top, when an adversary you're controlling attacks a PC, you'll take a number of extra character tokens equal to their attack bonus and roll them with your D20, then add everything up to get the attack roll total. I don't think that's how it actually works. I think that's some remnant of how it used to work and they forgot to take that out. <laughs> because I think what it's saying is that like if a monster has a plus three to attack, like to hit, 
that it costs three tokens for them to do that attack. I think that's what it's saying. What well, I, I know. I think that that might be what they're talking about, because if you're fighting, let's say, a dragon and a dragon is worth. Or you have like a. Well, I, yeah, I guess the, the idea is that you would need a certain amount of character tokens to even feel the creature of of, of high strength, except you don't. Fair be- enough, because later on in the book, that that's not what it says. It says you spend one because monsters have an ability later on called relentless, which is you can do multiple actions in a turn on a one to one basis. So if the monster has relentless three, you can spend three tokens in a row to have them do three actions. And I'm going to keep it a buck with you, chief. I'm f- I got no idea. <laughs> I, yeah, you'll notice. That's why I highlighted that section, because th- it conflicts with later information. Uh, it's not I don't think that's actually how it works. I don't know what they fucked up there. Something happened. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I noted that. Um, uh, oh, and monsters also. Here's the thing, Isaiah. There are some monsters that cost multiple tokens, but they have an ability specifically for that called slow. And if a monster is slow, so if like a monster is slow too, for example, like an ooze, uh, that means it costs two tokens to activate a monster to do one move. So if they're slow four, it would cost four tokens for them to do something. So there are some monsters that do that, but they specifically call it out with the ability. Hmm. Yeah, so I think there was some sort of different remnant of the action tracker system before this that had something to do with like more powerful monsters cost more tokens to do their thing or something, which just tells me that this has already gone through a bunch of like weird iterations probably. And uh, yeah, I think the final in- in- I think the final iteration should be uh, in the garbage. But anyway, yeah, no, I, at yeah. this point, I don't disagree. If, if <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think I like that the guy have pretty good, like. Uh, uh, I, I have a pretty, like, you know, decent amount of, of literacy, like comprehension. And even I'm like, I have no idea what the fuck this is on about. Um, you're looking at the uh, the jagged knife bandit, right? When you're looking at like the moves and stuff. Hold on. Uh, there's. I think there was one other thing I want. No, I mean. Oh, it, sorry. I might have. I might have skipped that. I think I was looking no, at no, the no. You're, you're, you're looking at the right part. I'm just. I'm just looking at the PDF real quick. Uh, oh. It talks about reaction rolls for monsters and like setting DCs. That's no biggie deal. That's no big deal. Whatever. Blah blah blah. Um, mm. that's all pretty standard D and D stuff. Um, it talks about advantage and disadvantage, no biggie. And then it gets into the adversaries. So yeah, adversaries. I actually quite like the way adversary stat blocks are done. Pretty cool with that. But there is one thing. So if you look at the jagged knife bandit, um, so again, uh, similar to dungeon world monsters have these sort of like bullet point, moves that they can do that are uh in dungeon world they're intentionally written to be kind of vague about exactly how the move could be executed like for an abolith i think it says like one of their moves is to like addle the mind of a victim or something like that you know so they're they're left a little open-ended so you can utilize them however you think might be interesting um daggerheart has motives and tactics So for the Jagged Knife Bandit, the motives and tactics says escape, profit, and throw smoke. And those are sort of some general, like, stuff they can do. However, Daggerheart also has adversary moves that have very specific mechanical effects. So the Jagged Knife Bandit uh, has an ability where they can attack from above and they do extra damage. So like they, you know, leap from the trees or whatever, but in their motives and tactics, it mentions throw smoke. Why is throw smoke a move, not a move, but the from above ability is a move, you know, maybe it's kind of like magic, the gathering, like they have certain words mean a thing and you have to like look it up on no. the website where like trample or whatever no no oh. no because the motives and tactics are unique to every monster or every adversary so they're not like they're not like tags or keywords or anything like that 
So what it says for motives and tactics is this describes the uh, adversary's general motives and tactics in a conversation. When in doubt, the jagged knife bandit will lie, steal and throw smoke. There aren't special rules about these. Improvise the outcome like you would for a player character. The thing that feels weird is they they have a section of things that don't have specific rules and then things that do have specific rules. Why do we have both? Just do one or the other. You know? Right? Like, throw smoke should be a move and it should say, like, the the bandit throws, you know, smoke on the ground and gives players disadvantage to try and chase him or whatever. Like, don't have... Because, again, Dungeon World does this, but there's only one list of, like, weird special abilities, not two different lists. And some of the motives and tactics on monsters don't have stuff that sounds like moves, but some of them have stuff that does sound like moves. You know, some of them is a list of, like, character motivations, but some of them have, like, attacks. What is what? Like, throw smoke feels like an attack to me. Not a motive and, motive and tactic type thing. You know what I mean? Uh, so I, I just felt like that was weird, conflicting, back and forth information. And I just was like, okay. Um, but on the positive side with adversaries, uh, I like they have very similar typing to Dungeons and Dragons 4th edition, which I think is super cool. There's... Um, Bruisers, Bruiser, Horde, Leader, Minion, Ranged, Skulker, Social, Solo, Standard, and Support. Uh, and those pretty much sound like what they are. For the most part, they're all pretty sh- like straightforward. Uh, and I like that. I like, I've said, I wish D&D labeled what monsters are supposed to do and be good at. So, you know, big fan. Um... And there's also a list of sort of general. Um, or is this is that later? Yeah, yeah, there's a list of like general abilities you can slap onto any adversary block to sort of change how they work. So the relentless one I was talking about, slow minion horde group attack. Those are all fun. They're all little like you can add these onto the creature to like make it do something different. That's a good one. <clears throat> there's also um, later there's a big section on how you can do like impromptu damage and how you can adjust monsters to be like more and less dangerous versions of themselves for like higher and lower level parties. So if you want to make a weaker dragon or a stronger bandit, which is great because I think every GM runs into that, that problem. That is really nice, honestly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, some of the math on it and like how it explains it is a little wonky, but you know, you can mm. tighten that stuff down. That's not a big deal. Yeah. Um, and then it gets into what's the, I think the countdown system. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I have no notes. Basically the countdown system's great. Uh, for anyone who's curious, uh, you know, look at blades in the dark. Basically, the countdown tracker system or countdown clock system is just a way to keep track of things going on in the background or impending events. Or if a monster has a super big super attack, you can use a countdown clock to like see, you know, how close they're getting to that attack. You know, it's sort of a it's just a good way to track information that's going to go on over a long period of time. And something I thought was uh pretty funny is that the uh the countdown the countdown system later on or er, er, yeah later on when they talk about preparing for a session they basically tell you to use the countdown clocks like apocalypse world fronts which i was like yeah of course you would okay uh it, it's a good yeah, I'm exactly. not, it's a good thing not it, a bad it, thing yeah, so it, it's funny. I, I don't know if they referenced the, the uh, front specifically, but I did have a feeling of like, that's probably what they meant. Like whenever Josh explained fronts, th- this feels like what he was talking about. It is, yeah. Like the deal is struck. Uh, the company raids the border yes, town. Yes, like that, that list. Yes, that is literally a list of a front. Yes, 100%. Did, did you example. notice real quick, just a small little reference to the character named Marius? I did not, know. So, uh, 
Matt, did you? No. So Marius Lapal is a character in Critical Role. Uh, he is like, he's one of the like the the people that they beat up, and then he kind of like begrudgingly joins their team. And he was the first mate of their turtle uh, pirate captain character. Oh, oh well. That's kind of so funny. the fact that they oh, reference yeah. Marius, the turtle person yeah, yeah, yeah. captain. I was like, oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good little cheeky nod. Yeah. Um, but yes, Isaiah, you're absolutely right. The way they're describing it in that section, 100% is a front and is a great way to utilize that that system. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Big big claps all around. Glad they put a countdown system in there. Very good. Just, just good for basically all games. There's no game I've come across at this point where a countdown system isn't good. Like, isn't useful in some way, you know? And then it we definitely get helps you. It, it So I think the thing... That for me, and even after years, that would help someone like me with things like pacing. Yeah, exactly. Because pacing's always been one of my biggest issues. So to know like every session or every few sessions, one of these things is it, it sort of ticks down ticks to down. a breaking point. Yeah. That's exactly the idea. Yeah. And and it's also kind of a a, a pseudo note tracker system too. Mm -hmm. You know, to make sure you're like Keep it on your notes. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, use use countdown clocks in your games, everybody. And then we get on to talking about gold. Man, is that uh, I, was, I yeah. just <laughs> bro. <laughs> yeah, it's so underbaked. I just I hate yeah. it. I, I, I don't want to say I hate it. I get what they're trying to do. I see the objective in that they don't want to have the D&D &D like we need to count out every single copper or gold piece to make sure we have exactly enough to buy X or Y, blah, blah, blah. I get that. But we, we said in the previous episode, oh, none of the items have gold prices, right? Nothing has any prices. That's still true. But they do, in the GM section, give you some very broad suggestions on how much things should cost. Tier 1 is worth two handfuls of gold. Tier 2 is worth four handfuls of gold. Tier 3 is worth one bag of gold. And then it says you can also vary this up based on the strength as well as subtracting one subtracting or adding a handful depending on depending on what you feel the shopkeep might do mm. I, okay that's a good starting mm. point i would still like a little bit more guidance on how items should be priced out yeah same yeah like i get it they don't want to have specific bespoke prices on every little thing because it's annoying game design wise. It can be annoying in play. You know, like I understand what we're trying to do, but I mean, but this system was also like kind of like solved. If you look back at the DMG or even Xanthar's, just make tables, just make roll tables, different tiers. You roll. This is the price. You're like, OK, yeah, tables that or, way you're, you know, or go for it. this was kind of already solved by, again, a game. They're already taking a bunch of stuff from Blades in the Dark. Blades in the Dark is like, hey, you have one coin. Trying to do something that costs money requires one coin. If it's something especially expensive, it requires two coin. If it's something oh, really expensive and hard, it's probably going to requ require a long-term project and maybe some coins along the way. Gee. Right? Like... Do it like blades if you're gonna take so much from blades anyway. <laughs> you know, because yeah, like no, I, if you're I gonna agree. I understand the idea of <laughs> abstracting the money system because I do I actually do like it when the money system is abstracted because I don't really care that much about like tracking every point, every piece of gold or every dollar or whatever. But this is like you like half assed, you like kind of abstracted it, but like kinda didn't. <laughs> you know, like or again. Like I said last time, do what Star Wars did and have the, you know, base price and then modifiers. You know, like, or I don't know if I called out Star Wars specifically, but sci-fi games in general do that all the time. So, wah wah. 
Yep. But you know what? It's also not. Luckily, the gold thing is not like a game breaker. Like it's an easy thing that you can just deal with on your own and just figure out, you know, a solution. So whatever. Uh, then we get to the there's some optional rules about some talks about GM style a little bit, which, you know, whatever. Yeah. Different styles of GMing. Sure. Uh, it, I, I'm not going to go through them all. You know, it says like role play style, exploration style, combat style, preparation style. And then it says more guidance to come uh, later. So that's not a finished section. But, you know, like, sure. Mm-hmm. OK, fine. I don't really have anything of note there. I don't know if you guys have anything to say on that one. No, not really. No. Yeah. Uh, and then it mentions a couple of optional rules, which. Ooh, fine. Um, falling damage is an optional rule, which I thought was kind of funny. Yeah. See, the, I, that feels like a weird one I'm to like, be an optional rule. Yeah. No. See, to me, it, it should really be the opposite. It should be. Falling and, and throwing damage as a standard rule, optional rule, remove it. Remove it, yeah. Yeah. Well, this is this this goes back to the philosophy, right? Of like don't take things away, make like add them and be like you can ignore them at your leisure. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean it, it it's not like a huge deal, but it it just was No, no, funny. but it, it it does back up that thing that I you know yeah. <laughs> I cripe about a lot. Um it does mention the fate rolls, which is sort of like a GM luck roll. I like that. A fan of that one. So kind of what you were talking about, Matt, where if you want to have a role where like there's no immediate thing that happens, but you still kind of want to know a result, you can use a fate role for that. Um, OK, this is another thing they took from Blades, uh, but Blades does it a little bit better, I would say, just because Blades has a little bit more granularity to this mechanic, because the way it works with Daggerheart is uh, the GM can ask a player to roll their hope or their fear um, and then uh, basically you pick which die uh, and you know if the die that you pick is higher you get what you want or whatever you know it's like a, it's a luck roll thing mm-hmm. Um, which is again like I said fun uh, but I do wish it had a little bit more granularity because in blades what it is is you get a pool of d6s anytime you try and do something that would be considered a fortune roll in blades uh, which is to say a roll that's not modified by stats in any way um or not, doesn't use your stats in any way. Uh, you would always start with one die in the pool, and then the GM could add or subtract dies of the fortune roll based on like circumstances. So you know, oh, you're trying to convince the guy. Well, you know this guy, so I'll give you one fortune die, and then I'll give you another one because he's buddies with you or whatever. You know, uh, or stuff like that. Uh, so Blades just has a little more granularity to it. Uh, but I like that's there. It also, and then it mentions moving and fighting underwater a little bit. Uh, it, 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 it's fine. It's fine. It's to like, be, you know. So I, <laughs> this one just doesn't feel like it should be a optional rule because it's a situation that could very reasonably happen. Reasonably happen. Yeah. 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 Th- like I did think what? that was a little. I don't know. I guess because now <laughs> I guess what I guess the reason it's there is because they're saying you know, most of the time if the players are fighting underwater, just play normally, like don't use any special rules and then saying if you want to use special rules, he has a couple of special rules, you know what I mean? I guess so, but it, it just seems like it affects the narrative so much that it, it goes outside the scope of yeah. optional. You know, if your characters yes. are underwater some, if your characters end up underwater, some shit has gone horribly wrong. <laughs> yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't know. And then it talks about adjudicating adjudicating player versus player. I think this needs to be a bigger chunk of text. (laughs) Yes. I Okay. It's it's too short. (laughs) There needs to be more here. (laughs) Because, like, I get it. The game's not about PvP, which is fine. But, you know, I do feel like there should be more guidance. It's literally one paragraph. It's like, what, three sentences, four sentences? Yeah. And I, I don't like that it's a full stop. It doesn't happen. Like that just seems like it, it, yeah, unsatisfying. I, well, like it's, rather it's, than just say you're not allowed to do it, go okay. It, well, if it's going to happen, you know the you could it, make it easy. The players do not roll dice. Your characters are supposed to be allies. Any combat would would likely take place on like a fist to fist, you know, yeah, uh, uh, 
either try to pacify or subdue somebody but you're you're unlikely to try to because the game is right it's supposed to be it's about like camaraderie and whatnot right well it, it, so the last sentence it says if both players agree it is come to a consensus on the terms of the role before it's made and facilitate the scene after the role is made in line with the terms so it, it's saying like if the players feel like this conflict is worth it to pay attention to and like spend the time on you can roll dice but it it just says the role it doesn't specify a kind yeah, of role or how it, many roles or how you, sh- it just says yeah, a role. I agree with you then. Yeah. It, like, cause I, yeah, I, I caught that. I just want more, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, it, it needs a little more to it. It, it just feels a little like, it feels like you started your homework and then kind of half ass towards the end. <laughs> yeah. It's a little half baked, just a little bit. Yeah. You know, um, then it has a big section on session zero. I, I, and I'm not going to go into session zero. Every, There's everyone and their mother has talked about everyone. It. And their mother's yeah. talked about it. Yeah. And, and the internet is covered in information on session zero. You can go look into it. Y'all selves. Uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to find stuff on. That's really, it. and honestly, I didn't even really read it, read it. I really, I don't know about you guys, but I kind of breeze past most of it. Pretty much. I mean, it's, the, yeah. the only thing that I actually took the time to read was the cats framework. I'd never heard about that before. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw um, that. Yeah. So I did give that a read. Uh, it's a safety tools thing, or a, it, nah, that's not that's not even necessarily true. It references the idea of bringing up safety right, tools, yeah. but it's more of a, uh, in layman's terms, it's just a basic outline of what is gonna what's going on in the campaign. Like, yeah, is your goal that you're like like t- it's the blades thing? It's Are like you tone like and style and stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're if you're playing Star Wars, are you playing High Republic, Imp- Imperial, um, Old Republic? If you like, are you mercenaries, the good guys, the bad guys? It just it kind of goes over the scope of the game. Which, yeah, no, I think that's something that should be brought up. Yeah. Um, and then it talks about preparing, you know, prepping for a session. This is where it mentions the prepping in terms of beats. It calls them beats, as in like narrative beats. Uh, but yeah, like I already said. Their apocalypse world fronts. They rephrase it a little. They recontextualize it. But their apocalypse world fronts. You use countdowns. Yeah. You know, you it's stuff in the background. Beats is one of those things I think a lot of people are already doing in their game, whether they realize it or not. You know, mm-hmm. I think that's pretty common. Yes, I, I do like this is that thing though, right? Where I was like, codify that shit, and they did. Yeah, yeah they Matt basically did. Yeah. Matt, were you gonna say a thing? No, no I, was, I agree. Oh, okay. Um, the and then it's so the adversaries building section. Basically, it says you should. Uh, so the game already has the tier system, right? So tier one is levels. Uh, I think it's one to three, and then tier two is like you know four to seven or whatever. Might be five to seven, actually. Um, and then wouldn't it be the, like the level ups? Like, you know, tier one is two to four, and five to that's, se- that's seven. That's what I'm talking about. Tier- yeah, yeah, yeah. Is okay. it five to seven? Uh, I don't remember from the character sheet, to be honest. Uh, yeah. Well, either way, point being, the game yeah, has yeah, the yeah. three tier system, and adversaries are organized by tier already. So, in terms of encounter building, you can already go, okay. Uh, you know, I'm not going to throw a tier three enemy at a, a tier, you know, tier one party or whatever. Um, and then within the tier system, it basically says um, s- to set up your encounters based on the enemy typings. So, like, it says put X number of minions, X number of standard enemies uh, per X number of PCs. You know, like it says uh, for a standard encounter try using a solo adversaries or a number of minions equal to the size of the party plus two or three from the bruiser skulk standard and support types so basically or it basically says stay within the tier and then give a number of uh give a number of enemies based on the typings so you know there's going to be more minions than there are bruisers obviously you know if it's a solo monster less of them if it's a leader obviously the leader should have minions and it says minions equal to one and a half times the party size. This is a very simple, straightforward way to explain it. 
and that's cool. I have no way to know if it works well or not without playing. Yeah, that seems like something that would require a little more hands on. Yes. Um, It's a very simple description. It's much more simple than the description of a certain challenge rating. Um, But yeah, I don't know if it works or not. So. See, we'll see later. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Did either of you guys have a strong reaction to that? Not really, not without playing it, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. so you it, both had the same like, thought yeah. I did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it just. It's, it, it's cool. Right. I really like it. Um, yeah. But it it's needs, just hard to yeah. gauge it. Yeah. Um, Requires some stress testing, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Why did I put. Does it mention equipment? I, is it just me or does the organization of this book feel a little wonky? Nightmare. It's a nightmare. It's, it's a little awful. Okay. Yeah. I kind of okay. hate it. Okay. Yeah. I was like, well, they didn't see, do an editing I, I just really, yeah, because just... it brings up a equi- We already talked about equipment and loop, but then yeah. it brings up equipment and loop again. Just in case you missed it the first time. I Yeah. I don't know. It, it, it's just, <laughs> it's just talking about the cost of stuff based on tiers, which again, oh, here it is. Level one is tier zero. Levels two to four is tier one. Levels five to seven is tier two. Level eight to 10 is tier three. There you go. Let me just say, as an aside, I hate I hate the idea of tier zero. Same. I know a lot. Just of call it one. It and I'm like, why? <laughs> just call it one. <laughs> why can't it just be one through four? I don't. Why do we have it, a zero? So I, I've had this this gripe with Lancer, but it, to be fair, in Lancer, it absolutely has a purpose. And I completely understand why it does. Okay. Um, doesn't mean I don't hate it. though. Wait, how does Lancer <laughs> say? I don't even remember what Lancer says. So the idea with Lancer is that everybody starts off with the Everest frame at license level zero, because if you start them at license level one, and technically there's only 12 levels, so rule is as written, you can only hit level 12. That means you can get up to three mechs, but you can't get the final thing for all three mechs. Right, right. right. So they wanted to give you that ability by putting you down at level zero. But why not then just make a a, a license level Level 13? 13. Yeah, you (laughs) do. Yeah. See, that's what I mean. That's why, like, zero almost. I never see a point where zero makes sense. But whatever. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think I played a one shot where guys like level up your characters and then start from level zero. And I'm like, you're like that why? doesn't exist. <laughs> no. It's like why? Why? And it's just like because you'll have more health. And I'm like, why not just give me more health through the rest of the game? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Like, uh. Um. Then there's a little running a session scene. Uh, it talks about crafting and downtime, which is cool. It basically just uses the countdown clock system, which is good. That is the easiest way to do crafting. Um, and then it gives some GM advice, like sharing the spotlight, how to handle conflict in the game, social conflicts. And then it gets into running battles and talks about the action tracker system some more. Well, Lamar. Obviously, we're not going to talk about that more. We've beaten that dead horse into the ground. Um, but yeah, uh, it does talk about running, running fights that aren't just about beating each other to death and about having fights that are like have different objectives and stuff, which is good. I like, you know, that's a good thing to explain to newer GMs. Be like a fight shouldn't just always be about can I kill a guy A or a guy B? Uh and it also talks about phased battles. So like, you know, multiple phases, the things, things changing, which is cool into that. Yeah. Um, good. and then, you know, in, and then it goes on into, uh, impromptu, impromptu NPCs, uh, and enemies, which is just like quick ways to whip up. Like I need a monster that does X, Y, and Z. I got five minutes. Boom, bang, boom. Um, Solid section. I did. Ba- I did read through most of this. Uh, it gives you a couple of of uh, fear moves that you could add to the creatures. Um, gives you some example experiences, impromptu attack modifiers and damage and health. All good stuff. Uh, the the one thing I noticed is that it didn't mention is it didn't tell you how to whip up uh, impromptu damage thresholds and HP for enemies everything has damage thresholds it didn't tell you how to come up with those on the fly which i feel like does it does it not explain uh, how those work early in the game like how no, it explains how they easily come up with that no no it explains how they work 
but it doesn't explain when it's talking about the impromptu NPC section. It's talking about if you, you know, if you need to whip up a stat block really, really fast as your players just did something you didn't expect, it doesn't give you some general guidelines on what creatures should have what kind of damage thresholds. You know? No, no. So, but I, I thought I felt like they brought up the math behind the damage threshold at some point in the book. I don't think so. Did they not? I feel like they did. Maybe for the player side of things, but not for the monsters. I don't think. Well, I know they give a couple examples of monsters in the back of the book, but like, I don't know if you're supposed to just use those as a template. I mean, uh, th- well, maybe. I would say yes. The only thing I'm questioning is like. They never say it. Why would you? Well, no, this whole section is on impromptu monsters, right? Impromptu NPCs and enemies. So impromptu means I'm doing it on the fly without any other reference. And it tells you how to give you. It tells you a way to calculate everything else for the stat block, except the damage thresholds, which are important. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like a weird thing they missed for some reason. I guess it also doesn't mention an evasion stat in there, which is also kind of important. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, yes, Matt, obviously you can just steal from the adversaries in the game already, but still, I would like that to be there. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> so the uh, I don't know if you know it also talks about character death, which again is already in the yes. book earlier on. I don't. So it, it, it did make sense. I, I yeah. So they're, they're basically just saying, um, breaking it down more or, or more specifically in the beginning of the, the bringing up the idea that death is a concept and that you have ways of dealing with it. And then for the DM, it's basically reinforcing that like, Hey, the characters can die. You probably won't find this easy to, to deal with. Cause they might die. Like, in a completely random event outside of their control. That's why we left it up to the players to really decide that. And yep. uh, yeah, it, it, it's it is along a similar vein to safety tools, but it, it's just being like, hey, if this happen, happens to you out of nowhere, don't freak out. Here's some ideas. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's more of an advice on how to handle the player. Yeah, character. Yeah, 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 which I, I okay. do actually I, I ran into this exact problem where a character died outside of like any relevant thing to them. And I was like, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> all right fair enough i didn't uh, yeah okay so I, I i sort of misunderstood the, the section a little bit there okay that makes sense mm. um yeah i mean good it's there then in that case <laughs> would have been nice if i had this before the great joke <laughs> yeah right <laughs> <laughs> um uh it then has nice. It then has a little section on running one shots, uh, which I actually really like that this is in the book. I, I, I feel like a lot of games don't. That's cool. Don't yeah. explain very much on how to handle one shots within their game. I mean, I've seen it before, but they're often kind of like brief or whatever. I also thought it was particularly fun. Did you see it had like a Mad Libs thing? I actually really like this. Yeah, yeah I thought that's, that was really that's pretty sick. I thought that was a great idea. Like, oh, yeah, Mad Libs for a one shot. That makes perfect sense. And you go around the table and everybody Mad Libs in the idea. It's a great idea. I more games do. Yes, big fun. I, I uh, no, no, uh, no notes on that one. Great idea. Yeah, yeah. I you think I missed that part. Now, now, Did you miss the Mad Libs? Yeah, I think I did. It's on. Um, but that page, sounds like so much fun. What the fuck? Two thirty. Yeah, or two. Yeah. It starts on two twenty nine. Goes in two thirty. Running a one oh, shot. Brah. Yeah, oh. it's great. Yeah. Yeah. No, I. Yeah, you can yeah. just constantly just randomly roll to determine what the Mad Lib is, and then yeah. you're good. Exactly. It's a great idea. I don't know why I've never thought of it myself, to be honest. Fun little idea. And then uh, part four, running a campaign. There's honestly, I jumped through 90% of this. (laughs) Isn't this mostly their own like world shit? Yeah. So it's a a huge portion of part four is... Um, the campaign kit so the campaign kit is a big general advice section on just how to run the game it's very general GM advice which is fine um, but you know not worth mentioning or not worth getting into specifics and then it has a it has a 
a four example settings basically that you could use yourself that break down like landmarks and settlements and factions and resources and all this stuff within these like four example settings so uh it's not exactly what you wanted isaiah but it does seem like if daggerheart were to have a setting these example ones kind of are that yes so they are and i i i honestly i don't know what's in there also kind of skimmed this yeah yeah no i i also did but it is something that i did want um, mm-hmm. Yeah, which is funny because you think that's something I would have like really hammered in on, but yeah, it didn't. <laughs> I mean, I don't. It's it's way towards the back, and it it honestly, when I got to it, I was a little surprised at what it was. I didn't think it was gonna be like example setting stuff, uh, but that's basically what it is. So I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. I do really enjoy the planning and arc yeah. chunk right there in two uh, two thirty seven. This is something like I try to do in my campaigns, but instead of it being three to five sessions, I end up overshooting it. Yep. And I'm like, damn, I need to really cut back more than I fucking do. Yeah. 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 Like it I said, happens as a gym. Like I said, there's lots of good general advice stuff in that section that if you're newer, you can read it more thoroughly. If you're more experienced, you might want to, you know, jump around, skim through, look at sections, that kind of thing. Um, and then towards the back, it's, you know, mostly, uh, it towards the back, it's just adversaries. Um, and you know, I, I do have, like, I wrote down a whole bunch of stuff about the adversaries, but like overall, uh, I'm just, I'm pretty happy. I think the adversary stat blocks are pretty good. I think they have lots of cool, fun ideas in a lot of them. I think there's like cool abilities in quite a lot of them. Um, and I like that there's lots of copies of, so like there's like, like what, five or six jagged knife bandit type monsters or type adversaries. I like the, I like the word adversaries. It's a better word, but I'm so used to saying monsters. Um, so I like that there's like lots of examples of a certain like faction, as it were. Um, and also the stat blocks are condensed, quick and easy to read, which is great. Um, and because you have the monster typing, you can immediately look at the name of the monster and see Jagged Knife Sniper ranged. OK, I know what that's for. You know, Jagged Knife Hexer support. OK, I know what that one's supposed to do. You know, like you just see that little typing and you're like, oh, OK, I know what this thing is for. You know, even if the name or like you go, okay, bear. Oh, a bear is a bruiser. Okay, cool. So I know what that's for. A dire wolf's a skulker. So they're going to like try and sneak around more. Cool. And know what that's for. It just makes it so much easier to parse out what kind of monster you're looking for. Um, It also mentioned it also reiterated the common adversary moves here, which is the minion and group attack, the horde, the slow and the relentless. Uh, If you guys look at my notes, I jotted down examples of each monster that have it. So like uh, Jagged Knife Lackeys have both minion and group attack. A swarm of rats has the horde move. Uh, a green ooze has the slow example. And then the acid burrower has a relentless example. Um, I think the acid burrower is supposed to be like a big purple worm thing that spits acid. Yeah, I was thinking that or an on keg or an on keg. Yeah, maybe. Um. The adver- I was a little sad. So the adversaries don't have any narrative descriptions yet, which I feel like the narrative descriptions for the adversaries is going to be where you get a lot of your world and world building and lore stuff from. And mm. I kind of wanted to see some of that. So I was sad that there was no examples at all, but they did say they were coming. So at least they'll be there eventually. Yeah, I was a little sad. I did want to see those. But, you know, whatever. Beta. We'll get there. <laughs> Hopefully it's cool lore stuff. Hopefully it's fun. Um, the... The, um... Oh, there was one... So... One adversary that stood out a little to me, or adversary type, is some adversaries have the social social type. I don't know if you guys looked at any of these stat blocks specifically, but any of the adversaries that have social as their typing, they have abilities or moves 
that are um, explicitly for like social encounters, which is like, and so it's an interesting idea to have monsters that you specifically call out. This is a social monster, right? This is, you know, this, this adversary is not for fighting. This adversary is explicitly for some kind of social encounter scenario. I think one of them's like a noble lord, and one of his abilities is to like call the guards. <laughs> Which is like. I love that. Nice. Yeah. So it's interesting, and I don't hate it, but it feels a little bit underbaked in its current state because. The game doesn't have any kind of social combat rules. So I'm a little unclear on exactly, you know, there's no overall social combat rules. So how exactly am I supposed to utilize these creatures? And when am I supposed to use these moves? You know, like, am I supposed to bust out the action tracker in like a social combat? situation I, yes i think Maybe? you are actually right yeah i don't because know because they well so remember they they specifically say you bust out the action the the action tracker whenever something is involving like adversarial uh confrontation not right. don't always think about it as combat that's like right. the big um give i think sure yes i'm just i i feel slightly unclear on how i'm like how i would run it you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah, as far as I'm aware, and to be, like I said, didn't really look at this part. They don't seem to address that at all. Not like, that I saw. This is how you do social combat. I, there, Well, so there is a section that talks about social encounters, but it it's not like... It's kind of just broad general explanations. Because the thing about the social adversaries is they have abilities. They have moves that literally affect how the like conversation is going I'm trying to find one now because of course i was looking at got lost but yeah they have like explicit abilities for it so i don't know it's a cool idea i'm i'm it's interesting potentially fun i just don't know i just don't know what i'm gonna what i would do with it without you know, i and I, i'm sure i could figure out stuff in the moment but you know as it looks on paper, I'm kind of like, huh, okay. Okay, mayhaps. I'm like, I'm like also trying to look at some of the higher end monsters, and I'm not seeing any like higher end ones that have the social tag. Maybe um, it's just. No, I don't think there are any right now. How many of the social guys did you see? Was it just like one? Urchant, Courtier, and Petty Noble are the ones I. Missed. Um, so, like, for example, so the Petty Noble has my land, my rules. All social actions against the Petty Noble on their land are made at disadvantage. Okay, that one's easy to figure out. Exile. This one's a long-term countdown. Spend ear, spend fear to, uh, when the Petty Noble becomes hostile to a target. When the countdown triggers, the target is exiled from the Noble's territory. Spend an additional fear for any additional targets to be exiled as well. Well exiled, the target has disadvantage in all social situations within the noble's domain. Okay, that one's a little... mm, Okay. And then guards seize them. Once per scene, mark stress to summon a group of guards to enforce the noble's will. I... That one's a little trickier. Like... That one's very short, so I'm like, okay. How much is a group of guards? How much is a group? How many? What should they do? You know, like, yeah, there's a couple of things. And then, like, the merchant has preferential treatment. Uh, A character that succeeds on a social action against the merchant gains a discount on purchases. A character that fails against the merchant must pay a handful of gold or more as a disadvantage on further future social actions. So it's like, okay. You know, like, I, I get what they're doing with them. You know, I get what the point is. I, it's just, it's just loose enough that I'm like a little unsure. You know, maybe I may be overthinking it, but yeah, that's kind of how I'm feeling. No, that's definitely fair. It, it, one of those things we talked about it last time, where it's like, I want to see this in the next iteration or two. Yeah, or I want to see this. See how the, farther it gets. Yeah, yeah, the bolts to be tightened down. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, 
So, I mean, overall, I, I think I, I like what they're doing with the adversary stat blocks because they kind of feel like a combination of D&D and Dungeon World stat blocks and there's a lot of really fun, interesting ideas with a lot. Like if you guys look through um, the moves of a lot of the monsters, there's some fun ideas. Like there's some cool moves that they gave them. Uh, the only thing that's a little annoying about the adversary stat blocks is that they heavily utilize the action tracker system. Uh, so right now it's like you can't you, you like there's a part of me when i was reading through the action tracker stuff i was like can i just ignore the action tracker system can i just not use it the answer appears to be no not oh. not at not at the moment wonderful yeah so but i do think i do think if they did another pass that you could rework the adversaries to work without the action tracker points. I, I do think it's possible. I don't think you have to rely on them, especially because you already have fear, right? You have the fear points already. And then you have action tracker points. Why? Why? The fear points could just be the thing. Just stick with fear. That's a, that's already a GM resource. It's like having these having two resources just make a brain do a hurdy. <laughs> a hurdy yeah. gurdy, if you will. <laughs> Mm -hmm. but yeah that sounded negative but overall I do like I do like what they're doing with adversaries in this game I think they're they're pretty fun I don't know if you get uh, same page not same page no yeah yeah of course I you know what the, the issue is that you're <laughs> you're saying a lot of the things I'm thinking so I don't really have I'm agreeing with like, you a too, lot of you're agreeing with like, me too much <laughs> yeah because I'm like yes I, I'm, I'm literally doing the trade offer thing pretty much consistently yep yeah, um, same. Matt yeah yeah, no, I don't really have anything. Okay. Again, most of this is again kind of like we said before. Some of it's common sense. Some of it's kind of like cool, cool new things. Some of it, eh, it's fucking half baked. Needs, needs a lot of work. Yeah, I mean, I, I the the adversary the adversary stat blocks to me feel like one of the places where they they said we're gonna do our own thing with blackjack and hookers, and it actually kind of worked out. Yeah. You yeah. know, I'm miraculously, the, yes. <laughs> Uh, their version of the Lich, and I like some of the stuff. It's flavorful. Yeah. It's very cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Lich I'm not fun. a fan of the countdown loops taking eight fucking loops that so, maybe miraculously combat is going to drag ass in higher tiers of play for this game, but I I do I think, doubt it. Well, I, I, I doubt so, it's going to be eight fucking loops. Two, two things. Two things to remember, though, Matt. I, a, I do think it will take longer at higher levels. And B... Remember, you can spend fear to speed up those countdowns. Mm. And I think that's kind of the big thing with the more powerful monsters. That's why I said the countdown thing in the fear section. I think that's why it's mostly for combat, because you can do stuff like speed up those enemies abilities. OK, yeah. So. I also uh, also keep in mind that a loop is just one player like loop eight. That means it counts down every time a player does something. So four players go. That's countdown from eight to four. It's not a full turn. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, 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 I think it'll go like, yeah, I think it'll go pretty quick. I think combat overall in this game will go relatively fast. I, I mean, definitely fast in comparison to D&D, &D, but that's not saying much. Mm. I. <laughs> yes. I don't know that it will. So I, I think if you have experienced players, yes, it will. Um, but I do actually think in terms of beginning players, if you took someone first game of D uh, Dagger Heart ever, first game of D&D &D ever, and you put them next to each other and assume that they exist in a vacuum each side. I feel like because of the hope and the fear and the different like stated degrees of success, combat will start out slower on dagger heart um i would say n no De well it, it would depend on the gm because the the mix steps the 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 degrees of success are adjudicated by the gm the player doesn't really need to know how they work they just need to tell the gm i got an eight with fear i got a 10 with hope 
and then the GM uh, can adjudicate. Well, you know what I mean? So I don't think the player of, needs I, to know I, much. Well, they do insofar as they need to know, like, oh, okay, I add a hope here, well, and they then need to get used home. to what your hope does and how that interacts with your domain cards. And yeah, but I don't, I don't, I think at low level you have a limited amount of stuff. I don't think it'll be an issue if the GM's brand new. That yes, I think it'll definitely slow it down. But I think that's always true. Fair enough. Um. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe though. Actually, actually, trying to pay attention to the action tokens might be the thing that slows stuff down more than anything. <laughs> True. True. <laughs> oh, it just keeps coming back to the action tokens. Yeah, it, that's gonna be oh. the, the clincher, methinks. Yeah, I really think it is. Yeah, I, I don't even. Oi. Um. All right. Well, there is a part five to this book, but it doesn't exist yet. Um, but it's going to be a homebrewing section. Uh, I hope it's very good. I would. I hope it has good homebrew rules, because, again, if the game is going to take so heavily from Apocalypse World, one of the biggest things about Apocalypse World was the advanced fuckery section was awesome and told you how to disassemble and reconstruct the entire game. I'm hoping that's what Dagger Heart's going to do. <laughs> we will wait and see. They even Leave mentioned my fucking across. They even mentioned uh, in the section where it says, uh, you know, what we're going to make. They even mentioned making card templates, which is Ooh. awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So like coming up with your own domain cards easily. Yes, let's do. Let's go. Mm-hmm. Again, I think the cards are such a such they're gonna a be a big sell idea, dude. yeah no yeah, they're gonna oh be huge God, sell. such a fucking smart idea yeah 100 percent. they're gonna be they're one of the fun they're gonna be one of the most like fun parts for sure mm-hmm. um and if we can figure out this isn't action track or initiative nonsense i'll be happy <laughs> that is a that is a the, 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 that's all folks that was for the fucking ancient people <laughs> listening um wow <laughs> Damn, that's rude. Now I feel old as fuck. Thanks. I fucking <laughs> love. I love Looney Tunes. We're we're getting there. We're getting to old. I don't know I'll when the. That. I, I don't Please. know when the uh, official you're allowed to say you're old cutoff is. You know. Um. I'll fucking cry, bro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I should fucking Thanos disintegrate right now. Oh. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. It's um, it's like the the end of Saving Private Ryan when Matt Damon gets old on camera. <laughs> <laughs> Just like. <laughs> Listen, man, checking checking people's IDs and seeing a two at the front of that number, but them being old enough to drink, I my brain went, wait, wait a minute, wait a goddamn minute. Yeah, you're like, wait, no, stop. You, you cut that shit out you right stop now. Stop this right now. Wait a goddamn minute. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Well, that has been us. We are done with Daggerheart. Um, probably not permanently, though. We'll probably come back to this. So. But I'm not going to promise anything right now. But I said probably. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? I do. Uh, that being said, now that Daggerheart is done, next week we're doing hot takes. Yes. So four. Uh, Isaiah's ready so to roast you. I fucking am. Uh, I'm going ballistic. When when last week's episode drops, we'll have the link to the the questionnaire in that episode. No, when this drops. Yes, my bad. Yeah. <laughs> when this, mm-hmm. when this, when this episode drops, I don't listen to Isaiah. When this episode, well, drops. no, 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 because 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 this episode drops next week, the day after we record. Yeah. So we have to do when last week's episode drops, because that will give us a week because we're recording next week. You see, what I'm at some point in the future, an episode will drop with a link. Uh oh. Yeah, yeah, just follow us on Twitter. I'm going to put a link on Twitter. <laughs> follow us on Twitter. It's very simple. Yeah. That's all you got to do. Josh, what is this Twitter? I only have the X. Shut up, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> I will not. I will never. <laughs> I refuse. Dude, it's bad now when like people I watch on online I know. have been like started off being like, I will never call it I X. I know. And now I know. Like, Nobody's... a year later, they're like, 
like, yo, guys, don't forget to look at my ex. And I'm like, I know. Ugh. Nobody sticks to their fucking guns. Bastards. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm still calling whatever the new Souls games equivalent of currency as Souls. Get on my level. <laughs> we are not the same. <laughs> that is not. Never mind. The not. rune, sir. It's Elden I'm Ring. Not getting, it's all about no, runes. no, we're not oh, doing this. We're not getting down. <laughs> we don't need to go down this rabbit hole. I don't want to go down this rabbit hole. Moving on. Jesus, Jiminy Ham. All right. You see, when Queen America started the revolution, goodbye. <laughs>